I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Four people in a conversation. Woo-hoo. The first time ever on the Lifestylist Podcast. Oh, oh that's cool. Okay. Yeah. So I'm really, uh, really excited to have you two here. As you know, your lovely wife, Christine, was on the show solo the other day. Yes. And I feel like we really got into yeah. the depth of your work. I got a mm. really good sense of who you are and what you mm. do in that conversation. I so thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks. And we had to, um, or I chose rather to divert from relationship topics, even yeah. though there were some good nuggets <laughs> kind of emerged. And I said, no, let's wait, let's wait. Let's wait till your partner's here. Mm-hmm. And uh, and of course, my lovely Allison is here for Hello. those listening. <laughs> we could call this perhaps our first co-host show. If you would like. Yeah, oh. My co-host, babe. I wasn't, I, I mean, this. I will take the role, but I did not tune in to craft any uh, I know. co-hosting questions. I think they will just come through you. I'm, I don't think you need I to I also agree. All. Okay. All right. Here um, we go. All right. So first thing I'm going to ask Stefano is what is a relational alchemist? Do you like the name, Luke? What's do that? you like that title? Yeah, I do. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Get, I get mixed. Get mixed. What is it? They get confused. Why do you even have that title? It doesn't make any sense. But some no, people really love it. I love it. And especially because I know how hard it is to name your secret sauce. And I have not in the five years that I've been doing this, been able to successfully say what it is I do. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I know what it is, but I don't know how to name it. So I like that. So what does that mean yeah. to you? To me, it means, you know, it's very personal for me because I looked at my life and I looked at where... I wasn't happy and I wasn't experiencing the things that I wanted to experience. And how did I, how could I transform those things? How could I make them different? How could I move from pain into even just simple pleasure? How could I move from literally chaos that I was experiencing into greater forms of clarity? And so the relationship part came from me just being deeply connected to everything in life, including myself, including the, you know, the shadows and the, the difficulty that I was traversing at that place in my life at that time. And also, what do I actually do in the world? How do I help people? And I just help them move from essentially an undesirable place to a desirable place. And that's really what the alchemy piece is around relationality or relationships. And so would you say that it is, because when I read it, I do think relational is relation to other people. But as you just described it, I mean, our entire perception of our reality is based on our relationship to our experience to and how we perceive what yeah. it is that's going on, yeah. right? Yeah, so primarily to self, for, for in this context, to self, to one's vision or purpose, what's really important to them, to romantic partnership, to you know, sacred union, to being in relationship with other people, to our a relationship to our past, to our present, to our future. Um, just the big things that matter in life. How do we transform when we're in an undesirable place in relation to that? How do we make it better? I really love that you do this work and I'm learning about you for the first time. And I really respect that because I'm already reflecting back to when I was in some of the most fiery, anguishing in some respects moments in my life. The further I got on the path, the more... I don't call those experiences in anymore, Mm -hmm. Um, but I would, when they would come in and I was deep enough on the path, I would then know, oh, there's something really big Mm -hmm. and important to be worked with here. And if I can just ride with this pain, fear, whatever I was facing in that, if I can be with it in the most centered, healthiest way that I can, I know I can alchemize this into something Mm -hmm. massive that can change my life. Mm -hmm. And once I started to learn how to be an alchemist, it's it's really important work. Yeah, and the interesting part about that for me as well is, yes, we want to move from an undesirable state to desirable state. However, to really integrate that and to do that in an authentic way where the patterns don't keep repeating themselves, we have to sit in that stuff. We have yeah. to connect to it. We have to understand it. We have to feel it to free ourselves. And so part of that alchemical process is being into deeper union with whatever it is that we're attending to transmute and change. How did you two meet? Since we're going to be talking about relationships and all. 
Um, we'll give you the short version of a very long story. Do you want me to start or do you yeah, want to start? Yeah. Okay, you, okay. You, you, you tend to tell it best. I'll just That's slip true. in every That's now and true. then and just say something. <laughs> you either give too many details or not enough details. That's right. That's part of my extreme personality. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's the extremes and I'm like center. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Yeah. I, I actually just make up details of the story yeah. that I can't remember. And then I'm like, what are you talking about? That didn't happen. He's like, oh. <laughs> but it made it sound better. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Well, so, okay. The short version of the long story is I was living in Encinitas, San Diego. He was living in Perth, Australia. I was in a weird transition where I had moved down to San Diego, was in my dream house on the beach, but had to leave. My landlord was like, you need to leave after a year. And so I was nomad and I spent time in Australia and I spent, I was just traveling all around. But then finally I came back to San Diego and I was like, I'm too old to be a digital native or whatever. I need grounding. I need roots. I need a home. So I went over to my friend's house because they were moving out of their house and places in San Diego go quick when they're on the market. So I was going to take over their lease if I liked the house. And so I looked around and I'm sitting and eating dinner with my friend while her husband's working on his computer just a few feet away. And he said, hey, Christine, I'm working on this new startup, this web startup, and I need a picture of someone sitting at the computer pretending to use it. This is good already. I don't know where it's going, <laughs> but I like this. <laughs> so I go over to sit down and pretend like I'm using this startup. And on the screen are the founders of the website, his picture being one of them. And so there's like six or eight people on the screen probably. Yeah, that's on, and yeah. I see his picture and it wasn't like, oh my God, he's so hot. Like it was more a soul recognition. Yes, I found him attractive. And it was also, I know him. Who, he's familiar. He was so familiar to me. And so I asked my friend, who is that guy? And I said his name, Stefano Safandos. And I was like, that's a name you don't forget. Um, and then he lived in Perth. And I was like, oh, I've just been in Australia. I'm over Australian blokes. Like, forget it. And she <laughs> said, well, he's really great. And I go, oh. I don't know. He lives in Australia. And she said, but you're both going to be in Estonia at the same time. We're both going to be in Europe at the same time for a mind a few months conference. Later. Yeah, yeah. About three months later. So she's like, there's no harm in meeting him or introducing because you're going to meet him eventually. So I said, okay, on one condition. Because I had had a pattern of dating, just not ready for commitment guys. And I was in a place where I was really ready for sacred union, conscious coupling. Like I, I was, I'd done a lot of work and I wanted a relationship. I didn't want to just date. And so I said to my friend, ask him if he's commitment minded, like ask him if he's ready for a serious relationship. And so she did. She phrased it way more eloquently than I did. And his answer was yes. And she introduced us over email. And then he, which I really appreciated as the man took the lead and responded first, which was so refreshing for me because it seemed like men had forgotten how to lead in a lot of ways. And I found myself kind of having to do that. And so he reached out and we just started a relationship over WhatsApp and really got to know each other. I mean, it's amazing how well you can get to know someone when there's no physical and sexual. Yes, We really went for it and asked each other funny questions to really deep questions. Like what's your deepest wounding with your mother and your father? Like, do you want an open relationship or do you want monogamy? Like, have you ever been unfaithful? We really went into it. So by the time we met in Europe, we ended up meeting a week earlier in Mykonos. We were pretty much already in love without ever... We didn't know how the other one smelled. We didn't know if we had any physical chemistry, but I think we could kind of tell, couldn't we? Even over video, like there was... Yeah, eh. you can tell there's there's synergy there, right? Yeah. You, you, You can tell that. And we were both very real to the point that, hey, whilst we're deepening our connection, our union and all of that, we do need to physically meet to determine what are the next steps. That's an important part of the bonding process is the physical contact. Obviously, it's evolutionary. I mean, that's how we've, that's why we're all here today. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But that was, you know, that that was, I I arrived, I remember arriving very clearly like it was yesterday, arriving in Mykonos and and arriving at a a hotel room and just opening the door and having a hug and it just felt like At 9 a.m. It was an awkward time to meet. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah. 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 Just just felt like home. It felt very mm-hmm. very much where we both needed to be. We moved in together that day. Yeah, it was not awkward yeah. at all. Like our first kiss was not awkward. Mm. We didn't even discuss getting separate rooms. It was like boom, we're done. Yeah. Like boom. So that's that's so that's so funny. I've interviewed um another couple that had that oh, we just knew thing mm-hmm. and moved really fast and got married really fast and 
think this is one of the things that we really, well, maybe not so much Allison, but that I really was thrown by was the immediacy and speed with which our union came together. Mm. Because in the past, if it had been fast in those ways, like moving in fast, being exclusive, all that stuff happened fast, it always ended up blowing up in my face and was for all intents and purposes, God bless the partners uh, <laughs> that I'm referring to. It was a train wreck, you know, yeah, ultimately yeah. just like, wow, bad move, bad move, too fast, you know? Yeah. I think the difference though is our fast track was fast tracking in different ways than you fast tracked before. Yes, it was not fast tracking the old, the shagging. Right, yeah. yeah. We became a couple before ever being intimate. And uh, we were honestly just trying to keep up with God. Mm, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Once, because uh, we had been friends and then once he took the lead. So I really also yeah. know that feeling of respecting that and being like, oh, thank God. I can you know? relax and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> being like um, feminine, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. finally. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> what is that the thing guys don't do? Like, No. Oh, man. Uh-oh. You no. guys maybe need to put on your own uh, <laughs> workshop or <laughs> something, but yeah, when he expressed his interest in me and, and took the, took the reins, um, once he, that was expressed and that doorway was open, we just got ushered. I felt like by mm. God got us into this other river. And then that river, that current took us and we were with it, but at times just trying to keep up with it. Like, oh, oh, now it's now it's taking us here. Now, now we're going yeah. here. Now we're sitting this here and doing this and being married in a teepee. And oh, but we're not even a couple, but we're being married right now. And oh, and it, yeah. it was just like all of these wildly divine currents. So that it was fast in a different way, I think is the difference. And you yeah. were living in LA and New York, weren't you? It's Correct. And the only game changer, again, because I was laughing when you said the Australian thing, because his thing was the the New York thing. Mm -hmm. He was like, I've done that. It was not a good situation. And I was in Brooklyn. So that's why it was always a no, even though he had felt something in all the years we had been friends, um, it was an automatic no because I resided in New York City. So I'd been by coastal, finally said to him on one of the trips, hey, I'm in town in LA. Mm -hmm. If you want to grab a tea, like we usually would try to do. And he said, well, what are you in town for? And I said, actually nothing. I'm not filming anything. I'm not taking any meetings. I'm activating life because I'm officially going to move here. And then that's mm. what gave him the permission to then have that exact conversation that I just referenced. Green light. Yeah, green light. That, um, is that why when we, we had tea that day, you you seemed so shocked when I, <laughs> when I switched gears? This is like, our guy's not that direct Normally, or, I, yeah, or is it just because we had been friends and you just weren't expecting that pivot? I think it was both. But I will say, I don't know. I haven't thought about this in a long time, but <clears throat> I, I was single and celibate for many, many, many mm-hmm. years. Um, and I don't recall, I, I could be in some sort of uh, denial or illusion around it, but I don't recall being approached. I don't recall men very often coming to mm-hmm. me and expressing interest. Mm-hmm. I just, I, that just didn't really I happen that, that mm-hmm. much. And so there's that piece of it. And then yes, the surprise of knowing you for four years and, you know, uh, working together in different ways on panels and whatnot. And I just did not know that you were ever attracted to me. So that was a surprise to the point where when he said it, he's like, I don't know if you know, but I've always been interested in you. That I went a little glitchy in my head. It was hilarious. He was like, uh, 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 (laughs) does not compute. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, did I just hear? I was having like all these different realities happening at once. And I was like, did I just hear him say that? And, but then I realized he was saying that and, um, yeah, it was it was a really funny and beautiful and powerful moment all wrapped mm. up in one. Yeah, it was very nice. Mm. Christine, you mentioned that you had been uh, attracted to unavailable men. What mm-hmm. do you think the pattern was uh, that kept that going? As I a think... former professional unavailable man, I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a few things. I think it was some codependency playing out. A little bit of, I can fix you. I can save you. My love can open your heart. So that there was that part of it. There was also some wounding from middle school to high school of never being the girl the guys liked. And so I would go over that archetype, that after that archetype of charismatic, maybe not diagnosable narcissistic, but some narcissistic traits. Tendence, traits, traits or tendencies. Um, and, and guys that were just still in the energy of kind of playing the field. 
And I think it was just my own unresolved stuff around not feeling enough, not feeling worthy, not feeling desirable. So I would go after the men who were desirable to most women and kind of had that like thing going on. And what are you saying? Huh? What are you saying that I'm not desirable? You're so desirable <laughs> in, in both a healthy and a hot way, my love, in all the good ways. Just, you got a hot guy. I He's do. Good looking dude. Well, good looking and dude. people would tell me when I would when I would say what I was looking for in a partner, and I'd describe it, and they're like, "Oh, you're not going to find a conscious guy who's also hot, who's like heart is open, who's also masculine, who's around your age." Like people basically told me I had to marry someone like sixty or above who like was kind of more beta and was more of an artistic type. And I was like, that's terrible advice. That's not what I want at all. So I think I went also the other extreme of like the the wounded um, 14-year-old, 15-year-old younger girl who never felt like the cool guys liked her. She was picking. And that's one thing I've learned over time with relationships, different ages and different wounds have picked different partners. You know, whatever I've needed to heal at the time, be it an issue with my mother or my father or what happened at eight or 14 or whatever, even though I thought it was my conscious self, like my present day self picking, I was attracting from a certain age or a certain wound. So I eventually got to the point where I got frustrated enough with it. I ended up breaking my right foot in Australia and that was it that something about fracturing a toe in my right foot woke me up to I'm like walking in the wrong direction like I'm moving towards the wrong type of man and I got really clear about what I wanted thus I was able to ask that question of my friend like is he available like please ask him because that's the other thing I learned about men they're either ready or they're not I mean that's a generalized statement but I think women tend to be open to relationship a lot of the time unless we're consciously taking a break, which I did as well. But men, it's a switch that goes on in a lot of ways where it's like, okay, I'm ready. Like I'm ready for that kind of commitment. And I learned that the hard way. So when he said he was, yes, ready for a commitment, he had played the field and done all of that. It just, there was a certain, I could relax a little bit. So I was like, all right, he's done all the things that he needs to do and he's really ready. I don't have to convince him to be ready. Steph, were you ever in the unavailable guy <laughs> archetype? <laughs> like, was had you attempted to open your heart before Christine? Yeah, fully? Had actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so, so partner that I was with before Christine, and I think for me, the the availability piece is really comes down to truth. Like, can you be very honest, as honest as you can be, with respect to what you have access to within yourself, with yourself and with your partner? And really in previous partnerships, besides the one before Christine, um, and then I had, I had some time off, I had some space as well after that relationship before I even met Christine. Um, but every, every one of my relationships, I was just very dishonest. I was very unavailable. I would present to be available present to want something. And these were coming from my own fears, my own insecurities, my own unresolved, unattended to fears from, from childhood, which is what, what Christine was speaking about earlier around these, these big dynamics that happen in our lives. And sometimes they'll just come to the surface of our awareness as adults and we almost want to heal them again. So we'll attract mm-hmm. very similar circumstances that bring them in. But usually we're not consciously aware of it that we can actually work with it. And that was me. I was just not able to work with my stuff until... Mm-hmm. I, I hit a, a snag in the road or I hit rock bottom really hard a number of years ago. And that, oh, that, woke me to, that woke me up to the fact that how I was behaving was coming from a lot of trauma and fear and unresolved trauma at that. And so I was very unavailable because I was unavailable to myself. I was unwilling to explore. Yeah, nailed yeah, it. Yeah, mm-hmm. unwilling yeah. to explore my own pain, my own traumas, my own shadows, unwilling to take responsibility for them. And therefore, I was moving through the world with arrogance, with ego, with fear, with projection. I would blame and shame other people. I wouldn't take responsibility for the choices that I was making. Or if I was angry, I was abrasive. I was protective. I was really armored in my heart. But with Christine, I i mean, two things. One, I'd really done enough work to really recognize, okay, here's where I can change and, and here's where I need to um, open up more. And... Christine provided the very safe environment, non-judgmental and compassionate and, and, and couple that with her intuition to see beyond that, to not react to my pain that didn't cycle and keep looping out each other's pain. Mm-hmm. 
And then I would be able to go, oh, this is mine. Let me lead through this right now. And I'd be able to own that with her and then say, give me a day, give me two days, give me an hour, whatever. Or, hey, I'm, I think I need you to work through this. Let's, this is a thing that we get to do together. I never had that awareness before. Like I knew all this stuff intellectually because I've been studying this, uh, you know, psychology and behaviour and people for many years, but it wasn't integrated. Wasn't embodied, and so it was all about what everyone else was doing, but not what I, I could mm-hmm. do for myself. And so, mm-hmm. the unavailability piece played a really big role in my life, and it destroyed my relationships. You know, mm-hmm. like it was, it was very challenging to be in relationship because I would never own my stuff. I think a lot of women too go for that emotionally unavailable guy because most women had emotionally unavailable fathers. Like especially if you think about women in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, our fathers were of the generation where it was hold everything inside, provide. You know, it wasn't really okay for men to have their heart open. And it wasn't a conversation really men were having. So I think that plays into it too. Like boys didn't have emotionally unavailable, emotionally available dads. So they learned how to like close their heart and not be available. And then women saw this emotionally unavailable dad and just have been craving that love And so it's a pattern that I think, because we work with a lot of women who are calling in relationships and it's one of the most common things that we see is going after the emotionally unavailable, not ready for commitment, heart shut down type of thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is tied to to dad as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Did you ever have that pattern? Yes, indeed I did. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I was just kind of reflecting on what my situations were. I think... Yeah, my stuff, what what keeps coming up for me that I think I dipped into is more the the imprinting cellularly and the neuro pathways mm-hmm. that just got so there within mm. my being that I really had to watch even while I was really evolving and getting pretty darn deep, deep, deeper on the path. I still, it took me a long time to develop trust in myself. Yeah regarding um, going on dates. And I think in the beginning of my celibacy, the celibacy was probably there more out of unconscious fear and protection mm. than anything. Then then it morphed more into like something else, a different kind of celibacy. But I think, yeah, I just, that addictive, it was, co- I, I dealt with a lot of codependent stuff. And the previous long-term relationship I was in was almost 20 years. It was it was over 16 years and it was just highly dysfunctional and at times abusive in various natures. And, um, you know, seeing that a, someone like me could get into that kind mm. of situation for so long, I really had to take the time to learn to trust myself to make healthy relationship decisions. And thank God, you know, I found my way with that. Um, And it's like truly a miracle, honestly, that I am with you and and got to this place because I came from just polar opposite, just Mm. really unhealthy, gnarly, dishonoring, dishonoring of my own self, allowing myself to be dishonored in so many ways. Um, and God bless that, that younger, you know, part of me, younger soul of me. So yeah, I really had to bust out of the addictive and neuro pathway kinds of things and trust in a new way forward. The last little test before Luke and I got together, I had to phone a friend. I was dating that guy again, um, like that, uh, air quotes, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a big test, you know, had all the things right that I was calling in, um, except for the, the, the healthy, true, sacred stuff. Um, he, he was the kind of person um, that most likely would never truly be able to see me. Uh, but he had all the old things going on, um, plus some new stuff on the list, uh, you know, just in terms of lifestyle and, and the house he lived in. It was very enticing. So it was a big last test for me. Yeah, those are the integration tests. Yes. Those are 
And it was gnarly. And I had to call my best friend from back home in Indiana. And I was like, oh my God, I can tell something big is like, is happening, Mm. combusting here. And she's like, you're in your addiction test. Like that man represents your old addictions. And I can see this from the outside. So I just had to like ignore all the texts, ignore all the calls and just like cut myself off from that addiction. And then right after that, birthing of the new way he and I got together. Mm. I like what you were saying, Steph, about being available for yourself. You know, that idea that you're willing to really have intimacy with yourself and to face whatever it is that comes up in that process. I think that was a really important part of my becoming available was just going off the market for 20 months or so. And just really sitting with the discomfort of what it's like to not flirt, to not, you know, exchange a little like on Instagram, to not like... No feminine diet. Yeah. Yeah. Did she she look at me in Starbucks? Well, I don't eat Starbucks typically, but, you know, (laughs) Erewhon, right? (laughs) Erewhon's like the modeling agency of Los Angeles. So true. I'm going to go meet a a beautiful hippie girl. She's probably there. Mm -hmm. Uh, But just all that stuff, just like complete detox from any little, any hit, you know? It's coming in a deeper communion with your shame. Yeah, that was yeah. what it was for me. Is is, and you know, shame is something I think that we will always work through, and unless we're enlightened, um, <laughs> but which is I don't think very available to most most people. But shame, man, shame just it just blocks so much because for me, I couldn't touch my own shame. And therefore, was so angry and frustrated, like a toddler wanting to have a have a fit. I was I couldn't I couldn't self regulate that shame, and I wouldn't go near it because it was so I didn't feel safe enough to do so. And so I would project it out. Or I would find avenues for relief and release, whether it was sex compulsion, love addiction, whether it was just whatever it was, you know, drugs, high intensity. Um, adrenaline addiction, whatever would relieve that frustration and tension of me not looking at my stuff. But when I really came face to face with my shame and it felt like coming very close to death in many respects, that's when I was able to be in deeper relationship with myself and be available to me because now I wasn't ostracizing parts of me. I wasn't seeing myself as this fractured being. I was actually seeing myself as whole and loving all the parts of Mm -hmm. me, even the parts I didn't like. How did you start to do that work? Like what was your first step in and really facing those those shame, what you were feeling shameful about? Yeah, so it was, for me, the catalyst was being in a relationship about seven years ago and that relationship coming to an end because she found out I was um, cheating on her and there was infidelity in that relationship and, and a lot of it. There was prostitution, there was sex, there was just, there was, I was being very deceitful. I was very much in my shadows. And that became a catalyst for really looking in the mirror at a deeper level because I saw for the first time what my actions were doing to someone else. So it wasn't secret anymore. It wasn't, mm. in, it wasn't in secrecy. It wasn't in the shadows. And that brought up a lot of trauma from my past. Memory started coming back to my own consciousness or awareness. Um, and that brought up more shame in me. I just couldn't, I couldn't hide it this time. It was too big to shove in a knapsack and hold. it was too big and too heavy. And so I had to deal with it. And so I went, really deep into that. I, I, I sought support. I, I work with shamans and spiritual healers and counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists. I went anywhere and everywhere and I spent a lot of time by myself. I shut the world out. Um, I just really made the decision to go deep because I knew I just couldn't keep living like that. It was mm. very painful, mm-hmm. too painful. It sounds like your, your cave time, Allison, when you, <laughs> you, know, when you went into the, the Brooklyn little vortex uh, apartment you were telling me about. Yeah. Um, There's something interesting that happened early on with us and it was, I'd always been the unavailable one in the relationship. It was the avoidant addict dynamic like over and over again, or maybe in many cases too avoidance, you know? Um, And then I started to become much more available because I became more available to myself and comfortable with myself. And when I met you, um, Allison, you probably remember this too, but I was like, I think telling you about, because you had been celibate for so long, Mm -hmm. you know, these long periods. And I was like, yeah, there's this thing, sexual anorexia. He's trying to like pin that on me. (laughs) I was like, no. I was, feeling it. It, I was feeling it out because- What I, is sexual anorexia? That was my that? question. You never heard that? No, I'm learning uh, another- It's like when somebody just puts up walls because they've been hurt, okay, you know? Okay, okay. And so they just be, 
become unsexual. And so when you feel safer to them to to just just not turn it off. When a a woman that looks like my lovely Allison, uh, I just find it. You know, how did you not have sex for that long? Mm Because I know guys, like, it's not that guys weren't trying. So Mm -hmm. maybe, you know, I thought perhaps you were shut down or that you were unavailable, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's just so funny to see how, you know, following my, my intuition and my trust and open communication about these things, like, so funny to think that I had that as a possibility because Mm -hmm. you're just so available for whatever depths of intimacy, vulnerability, love, I can go, you're there. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, always. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like we can maybe shut it out to other people, but that doesn't mean we don't shut it off inside ourselves. You know, because I went through a period of, I think we all have gone through a period of celibacy by choice. And I know that's when I went into deep exploration of my own sexuality because so much of my sexuality was based on who I was having sex with. And so I think there's a way that we can maybe shut it off from the outside, but that doesn't mean we're shutting it off. In fact, we're even juicier and more turned on because we're exploring that within ourselves and we're not looking for that validation. Because I think that's something most of us have to encounter at some point is how we're using sex as some form of validation, some form of, okay, I'm chosen or, oh, this person likes me or, okay, I can like relax because I'm attractive or whatever it is. And I think it disconnects us from our own relationship with our own sexuality because we're dependent on someone else validating that for us or giving us a pleasurable experience versus really being able to, you know, run that energy inside ourselves. That was a big part of it for me. Yeah, I got to a place where I just knew... Thank God the self-honor and self-worth and self-love and respect pieces had, um, through diligence and work on my part, had grown and grown and grown and grown to the place that I literally could not physically, it would be an impossibility for me to physically engage with someone who I knew was only seeing the meat suit. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I knew that number one on my list is I had to be seen and honored as the full goddess, magnificence, good witch, Mm. shaman, queen, things that we all are, you know? I, I needed to be seen on the soul, on the deepest soul levels. And I, you know, you can tell if you get real honest with yourself, really real. You can tell very freaking quickly. Very quick. Mm -hmm. If that person, where they're at. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I just couldn't. So I would just, it would just laser through like the little bit of dating that I I did do is just like such a quick, no, no, keep it moving. No, keep it moving. (laughs) I'm 40, 49, 41 now, right? It's like, you know, as as I was getting older, the lasering just got Got faster and faster and faster. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, The bullshit meter definitely gets better. Oh my God. (laughs) Really highly attuned. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, One tool that was really powerful for me was uh, was writing out a vision. Mm-hmm. You know, when I when I knew that I was ready to really go all the way and just open my heart and be fully available to a relationship in the way we're describing, I um, I wrote down the vision. You know, of every category of what I wanted in a relationship, from the most superficial compatibilities to the depth of you know being on a similar life mission and all of that, and. Uh, it's really crazy that I had been dating Allison for um, a short period of time and didn't see at first that she was the one on the list. You know, mm. it took, it really like took a peyote ceremony and some <laughs> interesting conversations that we had around that uh, experience for me to have the awakening that, wow, the vision that I had uh, dreamt of was actually sitting in front of me, you know, and it's, um, it's funny to think back now that I'm kind of like, yeah, I have this list and I'm just still looking, you know, like, <laughs> not like I was dating other people, but it's just, yeah. you know, yeah. like, yeah, the whole time she's kind of like, uh, dude, hello. And it was exactly that piece. I said to him, the medicine directed me to bring up three specific things to him when we got back to the house that night. And um, I just basically said to him, I feel like if you don't see me all yet, you will never be able to see me. And that like mm. woke him up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because then there was like, there was something at stake. I was really, it's not like you gave me an ultimatum, but it was an ultimatum within myself 
to really stop and go, wait, what? what's mm-hmm. real here? What's clear? And that's when that list came to mind. Mm-hmm. And I have it in Evernote still. You know? I don't think I've ever like read it to you, but... I've heard of this elusive list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't ever look in my Evernote. Boundary there on my computer. <laughs> look at anything you want, not that. But uh, I think you, you matched up like 99.9% of the time <laughs> uh, or the qualities. But it was in that moment that that list came to mind, you yeah. know, because mm-hmm. it was like, see you. Hmm, okay, who are you? And I was like, holy shit, you're, you're the, you're that. Mm. It was just like, just mm. blew me away. That realization, it was so incredible, but still persisted. And I want to perhaps see if either of you three have had this, still that nagging, but what if you're wrong? Mm. What if you're tripping and you just are infatuated or addicted or whatever kind of shit I've been through? Doing that thing again, just presenting in a different way. Yeah, yeah, because- you know, I had had so many relationships that were teachers based on both person's trauma acting out in those mm-hmm. in those dynamics, you know. So there was like a, a real moment of trust where I was like, God, I hope I'm doing the right thing here because this could hurt really bad and mm-hmm. could hurt someone else really bad if I was, you know, yeah, I'm all in. And then two days later, like, what? That was the peyote talking. I'm out or something well, like that. Well, you know? we navigated that well. And then, and then I definitely want to hear what you two have to say about his question. But before we get there, um, you know, because then when he realized I was the one on the list, he leaned in in a way that I had never been met by a man with and um, like literally leaned across, like put his hand on my heart, was like feeling em- empathy for the hard things I needed to bring up about him. He was feeling empathy for me for having to do that. And there was just this whole, I was being met in a way that I'd always dreamed of. And then when he said, okay, well, let's, let's do this. Then I was the one that got a lot. I was like, oh wait, now we're, now we're doing this. Like maybe we should sleep on it. So then I said, let's, this has been a very big medicine day in a lot of respects. Let's rest. And in the morning, let's see where we're at. And then that next morning in the living room, I was like, where are you at with things? So I think we really, in a very healthy, mature way, like navigated that the, the very best that it could have been. So I just, you know. Yeah. I uh, remember actually that the, the next morning too, that was kind of more of the turning point because I would have had it out then. Yeah. The night mm. before, we're still in the medicine. Like mm-hmm. everything's just in trippy land, mm. you know, obviously. Um, so it would have been really easy in the morning to be like, yeah, you know what? Like, let's just yeah. pump the brakes a bit. I think we're, you know, getting a little off track. <laughs> but that was the real one. I was like, oh shit, she's going to ask me like where we are this morning <laughs> after all that. And, you know, I was like, this is the moment, dude. Yeah, that was the real moment. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. He was like down on his knees and we leaned our third eyes together. Just all just happened very organically and just had this whole like mm. third eye to third eye. Like that's in that positioning was where we both said the yes to be together. And yeah, we had not even slept together or really done much of anything We physical. didn't for a long time yeah. after that either. So it's very funny. But. Mm. So I guess the, 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 the point here is, you know, knowing when to trust yourself to allow the trust for the other. Like, mm. how do you know? How are you sure? What, what work goes into knowing when you know and not just following some fantasy or sexual chemistry or something that could be presenting itself as like, this is a karmic connection here that I really need to explore. The list is really rarely about the other person. The list that you made is less about this person out there waiting for you and more about you. You asked the question before, how do you know? Like, how do you know that you know, it's not just the hormones or it's the limerence phase of relating or it's something else or whatever it may be? How do you know? Well, you know when you're that person on your list. Mm-hmm. That list that you made that Alison fills all the checkboxes, she fills those checkboxes because you're showing up as the individual that can attract that individual, mm-hmm. that can bring True. that individual into your life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how you know is when you had the out in the morning and you said, I'm all in. Yeah. Because you're different. And because you're different, you're creating and attracting something different. Yeah. That's how you know. Yeah. The list is not about Allison or some other woman or the qualities that she has. The list is about you. That's so funny. Mm-hmm. You, you reminded me of that because when I made the list, part of it is what I 
am capable of bringing uh, yeah, what uh-huh. I'm capable of bringing to the relationship, yeah. what I have to offer. Yeah. It was kind of an inventory of sorts. Like, yeah. all right, this is all the cool shit that I'm going to bring. This yeah. is all what I would like to be brought. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you can control that to some degree. Mm-hmm. Well, far more than you can control someone else's qualities and attributes, physical, emotional, spiritual, relational, whatever. You can, you're in greater mastery of what you bring. You want to develop an aspect of your personality? Sure, develop that. You want to work on a, a part of your life? Cool, you can work on that to be that person that begins to create those circumstances. That's where the mastery is, is in you. So you know when you're making now different decisions to what you made previously. Mm. Hot damn. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. about abandonment issues? <laughs> Oh, well, I want to say one more thing about the list, if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. sure. And I love that you said, if you don't see me now, you never will. Because that's so different than an ultimatum that comes from fear. Like, if you don't put a ring on it, I'm out of here. It's like discernment. It's like, if, if you don't see me, like my self-honoring choices, I'm moving on. And we can tell what that feels like. Because an ultimatum <laughs> feels like Meanwhile, this is like, like our second date or something <laughs> yeah, too, by the way. Like, fast. I give myself a little That's credit. another indication of that list scenario. Right. Like yeah. You're having those types of conversation that early on. That's telling you something about your level of maturity and how you've evolved to be able to create a relational dynamic like that in your yes. life. Relationships yes. get on the fast track depending on how much work you've done. If you've done a lot of work, like it just, it just goes. Because I think the soul is like, ooh, great. Here's my mirror. I can evolve even more. I'm already on this track. I've gone as far as I can, maybe solo. And now I get this incredible mirror and my soul gets to grow in this incredible expansive way. So for me, the list was an interesting thing because so much of my opening my heart was about surrender Mm. and about letting go of control and about releasing my attachment to the way things need to look. So I remember about four months before I met him, it was New Year's Eve, and I had my list of everything I wanted and everything that I would be. And I felt this, this urge, almost a compulsion to destroy it. So I went out to my balcony overlooking the ocean and I burned it. And I got on my knees and I was like, God, my picker just seems to be off. So I completely surrender. You bring me my purse. Like who's going to evolve my soul? And I could feel the fear coming up because it was like, but what if he doesn't have this? And what if he doesn't have this? Yeah. And what if I have to deal with this? And what, what, if, what if I don't like what God gives yeah, me? Exactly. <laughs> and it was like, wow, I really don't trust God on this one. I really do not trust God on this one. And it was very confronting for me because that was the final piece of my availability. It's like, I'm not even available to God fully that I can't surrender this. And so it was that full surrender in tears, like, I don't, can't believe I'm doing this, God, but I'm doing it. Like I'm handing it over to you and I'm gonna get out of the way and I'm gonna stop working so hard and swiping so hard and trying all the things to and make this happen. Look what came in when you did that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was four or five months later, but that's pretty quick, yeah. pretty quick. And so there was that, that deep surrender and deep trust. That was an important part for me yes. because control had been so my coping strategy and and certainty and needing to know and being scared to really let go of what I thought I wanted. Yeah, I relate to that too. Mine's not a long share, but I think surrender for me, it was very important. So, and that's something I, I, I teach a lot about. And I had my final surrender moment mm. as well. I just finally got to a place where I thought, you know what? I, I got, I am in so much love with my own self yes. and I've been living on my own for so long. I can do this, you yep. know? And I just said, you know what, God, I thought the vision that feels real is a vision that includes a sacred partner and perhaps a child or two. Mm-hmm. I, I I thought that was the vision. However, if that's not, I'm good. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I trust your way. And if for some reason this lifetime, I'm just meant to be sojourning along solo, I can not only do that, but I know I can thrive in that space Mm. and I will Mm. accept that mission and I will be rejoiceful in that way mm-hmm. of living. And that was my version of surrendering the peace. And, and you know exactly how it works right after you do that, then it was not yeah. long after. It's probably yeah. about the same amount of time. Yeah, my- and you really have to, do, you can't just like be like, ah, surrender, that's my New Year's intention. Like you really have to physically feel it in it's your body. So feeling. much so that it's almost a little scary. Like, yes. whoa, I'm really jumping off this cliff. I'm not just standing here looking, I'm actually doing it. Yeah. I really meant it. I really Mm. meant what I said. I was like, you know, I can be happy on my own. I think people, and I'm sure I've experienced this too, but not so much lately, have a difficult time with surrender because 
it's like one version of surrender is then you're not proactive anymore. You're not doing anything. It's like a passive surrender. That's then resignation, right? Yeah. Then there's an Different. active surrender where it's like, maybe you're still on the dating app. You know, maybe you get asked out and you're like, oh, this guy's iffy. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And you mm. go out to the dinner or whatever, you know? So it's like you're surrendering, I guess, not the action, but the outcome, right? Yeah. Surrendering the end Your result. attachment to that of how it needs to be. There's less of a rigid understanding of if I do this, it has to be like that. Right. Yeah, right. I had to cut out activities that I had attachment to. I couldn't be on the apps without having some attachment to them because they're so outcome-based. I had to really just let go of all the old methods of trying. And that's been a great lesson in other aspects of my life too. Is And I think, especially with Steph being in my life now and really holding that masculine presence and me having certainty in our relationship, obviously there's always a degree of uncertainty, but it's, it's enabled me to go even deeper into that place of surrender. Well, and there's such power in surrender because now we're co-creating with divine. Yes. We're co-creating with the source of all, of all that is. And so when we really mean that and express that, then all of our help, I mean, it's always there, but it really comes, comes in. ushering in. And, and if you can just then, after you have your true moment of surrender, really open up your conscious awareness field to, to sniff in and to feel the, the messagings, then that's, that's the active surrender is, is you have surrendered, but then you are heeding the calls and the directives of, of, of the divine. And, and that, that's the, that's the way. Yeah. All right. So what about abandonment issues? <laughs> Back to that. <clears throat> As as someone who experienced a fair amount of abandonment in yeah. different ways and mostly abandonment of myself, the, that mm. was one mm. of the huge blocks to vulnerability was, you know, yeah, betrayal. Eh, I could probably live through that. But someone just like, poof, I love someone and they're gone was maybe one of the, the scariest. Um, and for me, the solution was in really building a relationship with myself and with God. You know, yeah. of identifying how exactly I had abandoned myself over and over and over again and wasn't looking out for my own best interest from the adult in the room standpoint and just threw that kid under the bus over and over and over again for whatever ignorance or selfish motives or whatever might have been motivating me. But when I finally landed in my body as the one who is the sovereign being that is all I need to get through life, it's as though in a healthy way, in a fully integrated way, I was able to need another person and, and be fine with that. Like I, I need Allison so much in my life, but if she was to go for whatever reason, I don't go with her. I'm still here. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that. not to negate grief and, you know, things that one has to process from any loss of attachment, even healthy attachments, but I'm not afraid of being alone anymore. Because I've faced, you know, as we were talking about earlier, I've faced all the shit mm. <laughs> to such depth that it's like, I actually love everything about myself. Even my neuroses, I bite my nails. I do all kinds of gross stuff that just like is ridiculous. And I wish I could stop, but I just love that I do it because I'm so human, you know? Mm. And so just embracing my humanity and frailty and imperfection more and more all the time. Um, you do makes... all those things in such a sweet, cute way. Well, Sorry, thanks, honey. honey. He but like it... chews his thumb off. I'm like, Hunt, take yeah, it easy. Yeah, this one's like <laughs> about to bleed. Yeah, I'm very nervous. <laughs> Last night we were watching a show on Netflix. And I was like, calm down with the thumb. We were watching <laughs> Cobra Kai and I'm I like- know. Oh, you can hear on. it. You can hear He's them gonna munching get... on the skin. Yeah, and I'm like, like that's gotta hurt, <laughs> You babe. do it too? Yeah. Well, well, you know, yeah. So you know what's funny? You know what helped me get acceptance with that particular one is is listening to Ram Dot talk, you know, about all his different stages of merging <laughs> toward enlightenment. And he's like, yeah, and there's, I've just still bite my nails, you know, 60 mm. years into the journey. I was like, right on. Yeah. Cool. But anyway, it's, it's in that, I guess it's in that being in love with yourself um, has what, has what has really melted my issues with abandonment and, and, you know, those limits of the depth <laughs> to which I'm courageous enough to go in my love. It's like, there is no place I won't go. And sometimes it's, it's not even scary. It's just the depth of love and the depth of feeling is so intense that it just, it like, it breaks my heart open. Mm -hmm. And when it happens, I just, I just fucking lean into it. I'm just like, more. 
And so the learning in the in this expression of this depth of love is not the learning from the wounds and from the childhood. It's the learning in how deep can you go without fear. Yeah. It's just absolutely fantastic to observe. I'm so proud of myself. Mm-hmm. Mm. That, that, I'm, that after all the wounding by others and by self, that I'm just like, I'm here for this. Mm-hmm. And what I'm really here for is I'm here for myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To be able to experience that full expression of my humanity mm-hmm. as reflected by other, you know, mm-hmm. in such a beautiful way. But man, that being there from where I come from of like, I'll have sex with you. I will never marry you. I'm never going to be monogamous. We're never having kids. You're not spending the night. Like it's embarrassing to admit that that's where I was for a vast majority of my adult life. But to go from there to this level of depth is is incredible to experience. Yeah. And you're just so, I just want to take a moment to honor you because you're just so honoring of our relationship and just so respectful and just go above and beyond on your own innate accord. You just go above and beyond what is needed to just create a very sanctified, harmonious, Mm. strong space for us. You know, it's like even something is, is little, but it's a big thing, but could be viewed as small. Like we're not legally married yet, but you chose, I said nothing, but the day you, the moment you proposed to me, you also wanted me to put that ring on your left hand, on your like, and that typically doesn't happen until like the wedding has happened. But you know, stuff like that you do on a regular basis, it just allows me to just feel so safe in this with you, mm. you know? That safety feeling. Mm. So then what is the, <laughs> what are the million steps? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, what's right? the step? But, you know, the pattern of relationship where karmically, you know, there's mommy, there's daddy, yeah. there's mommy, there's daddy over and over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, implosion, explosion, pain, more trauma now from the enmeshment and the uh, the painful separation and untangling. It's like, what's the, what's the line that we cross where the learning is the learning of expansion that I just described? It's mm-hmm. a learning, how much can I love? How much can I trust? How much can I honor? How much can I hold space? Mm-hmm. How selfless can I be? All of those things. It's a learning in an expansion rather than a learning in contraction and more pain of those patterns. Yeah. It's like, what is the, I don't know exactly what it is for me, the turning point. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was a <laughs> enough of that pain to where I really hit a depth of surrender that you were describing yeah. and, and call, you know, honored God and just said, Hey man, I'm done picking like you pick now. Yeah. Here's my, here's my list, you know, <laughs> yeah. but you pick and just knock me in the fucking head when she's there. Yeah. I think you know? it's, well, I'll start and then you pick it up. But I, I had a similar experience with Steph of, of getting to the point where it's like, oh my gosh, I am experiencing so much love. And that's what's bringing the tears now. Not the pain, but the expansion of love. And it it is scary in a little bit because it's like, whoa. And I think for me and what I see in a lot of people is you've got to go through the contraction piece first. You've got to like have the contraction, have those triggering relationships and then go into the shadows, go into the pain and feel the anger and feel the sadness and grieve. Because I think that's a big piece that we don't do well is we don't really know how to grieve. Feeling is free. Yeah. We know how to be victims, but we don't necessarily know how to grieve, to let go of the relationship we always wanted with mom and dad, to, to, to really grieve the hardships that we've had and and because that's a huge letting go process. And then I think ultimately we get to a place of deep forgiveness of I forgive my parents, I forgive myself, I forgive anyone who's hurt me and not from a just words kind of place, but that really deep forgiveness because I think that's what really sets us free and then opens us up back to God because whenever we're harboring any judgments or resentments or, or anything that's keeping us in that contracted place, we can't open. 
And for me, it's been that huge emotional release diving in those shadows, but it's the forgiveness piece that is the crossover, like that really deep forgiving because I, I've learned in my own development and from spiritual teachers that when we really forgive misunderstandings we've bought into, that clears karma as well. Because we're not only doing the forgiving of this lifetime and everything, but we're, we're forgiving beliefs that we've been carrying as a soul or patterns for thousands, millions, however many years. And so I think that's the crossover place where we start to actually open up and experience that more expans- expansion. But you've got to feel before you can forgive. Oh, for sure. And that's what most of us don't do. We <laughs> yeah. don't feel. So you're asking for a process and the process, and there are many stages to the process unraveling for itself, but before action steps can come, you just got to sit with the stuff that you've been avoiding. Yeah. One, use the, because you do a really good, a better storytelling than me in this sense, the analogy of the, the gold chain. Because I think that's an important um, one in terms of an initial first step yeah. that is linked to the um, – the the Rolling Stone effect. Yeah. Yeah. Or well, the snowball effect. So have you momentum. ever yeah. Have you ever had a really tangled necklace like a gold chain? Mm-hmm. It's just thin, tangled. Like, thin, just like that. Thin. Mm-hmm. And you pick at it and you pick at it and you pick at it and and then you reach that one knot. That one knot that like just undoes everything. And it's like, ah. Oh. And that's how it is with looking at our own stuff. We pick and we pick and we pick. And eventually we get deep enough where we reach that one knot that kind of just releases everything. And it's like, we feel like we can breathe again. And then you say, I did it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? exactly. And then there's maybe another big knot. But the, the, yeah. but the point of that is that these these knots or these these emotional wounds that, that we develop during our formative years, the core infliction of those wounds, the biggest ones that we have, mm-hmm. they're the ones that stick around and keep influencing and keep magnifying and amplifying our current state situation. I want to, I want to say something that you, you mentioned earlier when you, you're being very deeply vulnerable about that if you were to lose this relationship, yes, you'd go through the grief, but you'd be okay you'd be okay. And the abandonment piece around that, the, the, the beautiful thing about all of that is, and all I could think of was, wow, you're at a place where you really love and care about yourself, where you back yourself enough, where you're, con- not arrogance, but confidence, where you're confident enough about who you are, about what you bring to the relationship, that you can go deep. Because you don't have that fear of this person abandoning you because you're not abandoning yourself anymore. Right. So now, guess what? Infinity and beyond. Like you can go to whatever depth. And yeah, you, as you push the edges, there'll be fear, but not enough fear that will stop you from pulling back and saying, ah, no kids, no marriage. I'm not going to see you today. My terms, I'm going to be the boss. Like, none of that. Because, and if it does come up, you're able to check it. But none of that's happening because... You love all these parts of you. Something that come up, come up for me when you're talking about your, your fingers and that, I don't bite my, my, um, my skin too much, but when Christine will, will, I see it as picking on my quirks or she'll say something about my quirks, whatever it may be. And if I, am I in a mood? Like I'll get upset and I'll get upset at her and I'll project. But what it just made me think of then is like, oh, I think there's some spaces within me that I need to love a little more because if I love those spaces within me more, I would just go, yeah, sure, no problem. Love you. See ya. <laughs> and most of the time I do, but there's times when I don't. So that, that's giving me, it, it made me think, oh, shit. I think I've got to look <laughs> at some more stuff within me. Because when always. she's picking. Yeah, and always is the answer, of yeah. course. Yeah. But when she's picking on me. I really uh, don't pick on know, you. It just lands like, that that's way. That's why I'm going you, like that. Yeah. <laughs> there's he air is, quotes. Yes, air quotes. He is using it's air huge. quotes. Everyone Changing listening. the tone of my voice to the people that are only listening to what you're <laughs> picking. <laughs> but it's a thing that I get to look at a little more because if I really didn't give a fuck, like I wouldn't be, leave me alone. Stop. Stop annoying me or stop picking on me. I wouldn't say those things, right? So that was interesting too. Mm. There's a piece in that, um, in those cycles of painful learning in relationships that I think is really interesting. And that is, as you were mentioning in our formative years, you know, the first seven, mm-hmm. eight, 12, whatever, mm-hmm. we're walking around in a theta state. We're totally being programmed by mm-hmm. every experience we have. We're logging that in the hippocampus state, for yep. later on so we can avoid that same danger, that whole yep. mechanism psychologically. I think the trap for us that have entered into relationships that were less than pleasurable and ultimately painful or perhaps even traumatizing more um, is that familiarity. Because it's safe. Yeah. Well, no, because it's familiar. Because 
there's a part of us that recognizes that type of dysfunctional love, right? That type of connection. So it's like, and then you meet that person, you're like, it just feels so right. It's like that thing you told me when it feels like a drug, you know, run. My dad's always told me that. And I thought, what? That why that's what makes you stick around, you know? (laughs) Ah." But it it doesn't, it doesn't feel right because it's right. It feels right because it's familiar. Yeah. Yeah, and familiarity is safety yeah. because the brain, yeah. pattern, being a pattern recognizing machine, wants to repeat. So if it's a drawing familiar experiences, that equates that to safe. So we're either, you know, we're either approaching or we're retracting. And so if it's familiar, even though it's not good for us, it's going to feel safer because, oh, well, we've dealt with it before, we've survived, we're still here, let me move towards that. And so we approach it as opposed to retract. And so we have to recognize and that's where that deeper work comes in when we get to ask questions, have reflections from people that are close to us or people that we trust and respect and review that can say, hey, yes, this is a pattern that you're doing, but is it really what you want? Where's it coming from? And then we can start that deeper inquiry as well into self. So I I wonder if there's a way to, um, you know, bypass the cycles of relationship and just when you're single, go do fucking breath work or plant medicine or EMDR, every kind of therapy and just like get to the root of that and perhaps not have to go through 20, 30 years of dysfunctional relationships to, to arrive there. Well, that, I mean, we've talked about this a lot. That that was similar to my path. Remember? Oh, that's right. You're like, oh, right. You did that. Um, (laughs) So yeah, it is possible. So in all the times that you were learning through relationships. <laughs> totally forgot about that. I was just home in my little Brooklyn cave in my little, yeah, cave initiatory period. And I was just learning through my relationship to great spirit and, mm-hmm. you know, going to the depths of, of myself and um, plant medicines call to me occasionally, but it's pr- primarily my work is done without uh, the aid of that. And, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so I, I was learning and got to my place of sovereignty and readiness of sacred union without having to go through relationship dynamics. Right, I forgot about that. You are the model case for for that <laughs> well, <laughs> as a path. I mean, you know, and it's like, maybe that was as difficult or painful for you as me going through 15 relationships or whatever. It was not you know? easy, yeah. Maybe there's not a right or wrong way. I, I think Mm-mm. I'm just grasping. I'm like, there had to have been an easier way to arrive where I am <laughs> right. now than the way I did it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it. I think it all depends on how much we have to resolve, and and karma and divine timing. Because we talk about it a lot. Like, if we had met three years ago, this wouldn't have happened, right? And and we did meet three years ago. You, you mean like three years, five years before ago. Oh, we yeah, actually yeah. met? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for catching me on that one. Uh, because we not, we weren't in a place where we mm. would have. Fit. We, we wouldn't would have been able resonated. to receive each mm-mm, other. Mm-mm. Yeah. But I, I encourage people in, especially in their twenties and early thirties, uh, to really dive in yeah. and really do that work. I think it's. I can't believe that we're encouraged to get married before thirty. That just bog. I did, and it didn't work because we just don't know ourselves. We yeah. haven't really experienced. Our brain is really still forming until twenty five. And you hear there's so much conditioning to get married before a certain age, especially for women. And it, 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 I think it just creates more issues than it prevents because there's this pressure to get into a relationship. I know for me in my single years, people would be like, you're still single? Why? They'd look at me like I had some disease or something. Like there was something wrong with not being in a relationship. And I think if we really honored singlehood as a rite of passage. Like this is the the internal work. You're going to go into your cave. You're going to deal with your stuff so that you're, you come with less baggage to a relationship. Any relationship is going to have work, but we, we came with like carry on, not cargo. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, two things as you were talking came up. One, I think a lot of people are wanting to learn more about celibacy right now. Yes. I don't know if you guys are getting those inquiries, but I share about it occasionally on podcasts. And um, I get a lot of messages from people, still a little more women than men mm. asking about it. <laughs> but, um, you know, they'll say like, I, where can I hear about your whole journey of your almost five years of doing it? Because I think as the planet is doing its alchemical process and shadow 
transmutation and, and awakening. Um, obviously, all beings are yeah. as well. And the more people's souls are waking up, that piece of doing that work and learning, feeling like something big must come of this yes. if you're celibate. So that was one. And two, if I could just give one quick piece of advice for people that are wanting to, like you said, get on the fast track of not having to go through all the gnarliness, it's just <laughs> tune into what sacred practices can I do that will allow me to land in and get embodied in my personal sovereignty. Mm -hmm. That's the key, you know, because it wasn't until I did all the years and years and years of work of, and I landed in my sovereignty and you did all the years and years and years of work and you landed in your sovereignty, then God, God has brought us together. It was yeah. only when I was sovereign and as my individual self and you were. So it's like just going into whatever meditation you can and asking your soul, asking your intuition and asking whoever it is that you speak to, what practices, what tools, what rituals will aid me in becoming a whole sovereign mm. being? If you want to get on the fast track to sacred union, you have to get into sovereign union first. I think that's so true. And that when we were talking about how you know, I think one of the ways you know is because when you're in that sovereign place, you feel totally yourself. Like when Steph came into my life, I just was me. There was no contorting. Yes. There was no, what does he want me to be? There was no saying yes to something I liked when I really didn't. It was just fully authentic me. And that was such a shift because, and it wasn't until I had that shift that I realized how much I'd contort myself into whatever I thought I needed to be out of my own insecurities or whatever. And that feeling of, I am, I am me, this is me. Yep. Take it or leave it. Like this, this is who I am. And I feel safe, not because you're making me feel safe, but I feel safe enough with me that I can just be me. Yes. Bingo. Beautiful. Yeah, isn't it really incredible to be with someone who uh, just loves you unconditionally, that you can be yourself? You know, yes. it's like, with, I'll never forget. I know we, I talked about this in our one-on-one -on -one yes. interview, but when I went to dinner with you both in Palm Springs at the Joe Dispenza thing, and that thing you said of when you meet the right person, it feels like home. It doesn't feel like a drug. I mean, that was like this laser etched into my awareness and um, and I've heard it said in different ways, but because I'm someone that used to do a lot of drugs, I really related to that. So I know what it's like to get that drug yeah, and want yeah. the drug. Like I have an intimate relationship with that that dynamic of addiction, you know. But it's uh, I think what feels like home is what you're describing. It's like you know who you are, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, and when you can really present that in an authentic way mm. with without any hiding and that person is just like, yep, I'm about it. Like what a powerful experience that is. I mean, even with her sometimes I'm like, God, can I really be this much myself? And I push the limits and she's like, I love you even more. Like what? <laughs> well, I'm laughing because the first time I ever stayed the night, he was like in the bathroom doing stuff. And I think you, you, yeah, you just opened the door and you're like, w w said something like, it's better to just rip the bandaid off. And he like came out with all of his like biohacking sleep gear, <laughs> his like breathe strip on his nose and his like head, his cap and like just My all- My EMF cap. Yeah, like all the things that he does to like sleep in the way that he likes. Just the very first night, it, you know, he's just like, this is how I sleep. This is who I am. It's better to rip the bandaid off. And I was like, oh, this is actually kind of funny. Okay, I've never- <laughs> had this and this is funny. Okay. You know, so that's how it's been every time. Like when you show me more little neuroses or quirks, it's, um, yeah, you're, yeah, you're just such a lovable guy. It takes a special woman to be able to get on board with all this, this circus, <laughs> trust me. And I, and I'm not being self-deprecating. It's true. I mean, if you follow me around for the day, all the rituals, all the control, all the shit, like it's, it's out of control, but it's fun. Okay. So I, I feel like we've kind of covered I think what most people want, those that desire a relationship, mm -hmm. you know, is one in which the um, the unfolding and the growth is coming out of, of love and expansion rather than pain and contraction. We've talked about um, some ways to arrive there, you know, in the way that Allison did and her just going within with me, you know, trying to learn relationships by doing relationships. Um, but 
maybe we could talk about some of the tools that we've each used to really get down to that deep stuff, the deep wounds, mm. the core shit that cause us to not to abandon ourselves, you know, to disrespect ourselves, to dishonor ourselves, to dishonor and disrespect other people, uh, to be unfaithful, whatever that looks like, however that manifests. Um, what are some of the ways that you guys have really gotten to those, those core wounds and really gotten in there and done some work to heal? Mm. Breathwork has been a very powerful catalyst for my growth and my own exploration of self. And I'm a practitioner now. It's part of how I, I work with clients as well. But many years ago when I was exposed to breathwork, it, it completely changed my life. It unlocked aspects of self that I just, I couldn't touch with talk therapy and conscious cognitive work. Mm. And it really unpacked a lot of this repressed trauma that was held within me at a cellular level, but also within, you know, within the unconscious self. And then I was able to begin at some point thereafter with, with intention and effort, of course, to make sense of all of that. And then translate it into something tangible that I could then work with. I could bring that to my therapist or my coach or my shaman or I could bring that to a, a journey of sacrament or plant medicine or whatever it may be. And I resonate very much with you. Um, I've been exposed to various plant medicines and sacraments. However, and I can speak for you in this sense, mm -hmm. I know for, for us it's the can you do the deeper work in familiar states of consciousness mm -hmm. and do the majority of your depth of exploration, excavation there, and then use plant medicines as something that, A, very sacred, um, and B, something that can begin to expand at a deeper level. But because there's this, I've sat with some very painful emotions that breath has accessed for me um, in a safe environment, um, and I've done that and I've got the confidence and the courage that I've gained from that, it's allowed me to go even deeper. So breath for me, again, many tools that I've personally used, but breath is just so, it has mm -hmm. been so powerful, continues to be so insightful for me. Yeah. It really is. I love that modality. It's not really a modality, but I love that practice as well. I have had just as, yep. you know, such powerful journeys you know, realizations. One, uh, while we've been in here in Austin, actually, and it was just a full on right out of the gate. As soon as the breath got activated, I was, you know, traversing around and being taken to all these different unseen realms and then also very tactile, earthly things that I needed aware awareness around and just through the breath. Mm. Mm. That's yeah. it. The memories will come to you. Thoughts will come to you. Ideas will come to you. It's almost like the breath accesses parts and symbols of your of yourself that you weren't able to make dots and connections to before. So it's been a very personal, powerful practice for me. For me, it's been the somatic work. So it's been the not talking about things, but really getting into my body and feeling, like feeling the feelings, making sound to those feelings, being loud, being messy, using my body to move stuff out of me. Because I, you know, was wound very tight with worry and anxiety. And we talked on your, our, our solo podcast about being on antidepressants. So everything was really contracted and controlled. And so for me, that somatic work, especially with therapists, that's also been really helpful for me, having therapists and coaches. Mm -hmm. I'm in the phase of my journey now where I can really go to myself. But for, you know, a good almost two decades, I really... Um, needed a practitioner because with it, it kept me going and it helped me, it moved me faster because skilled practitioners could really see my blind spots and could take me past my edge. And so getting to that raw, wild woman, guttural, like emotion that I had been holding in my body for, you know, years and years and years, um, even getting back to like feeling how I felt in the womb, it, that kind of expression of emotion has been the biggest catalyst for me because it's like switched me back on in so many ways. And it's after those big emotional releases. I love breath work as well. And it seems like the big, like not just catharsis, but really therapeutic emotional releases. That's when I reach the states of ecstasy. Mm. That's when my logical mind switches off and I can see more clearly. I have more access to spirit. That's when I get the best visions. Even though I'm exhausted after something like that, it's like, 
oh, it's like the clearing comes in. So that's been something that's been really, really useful for me. I really like the vision of wild woman, yeah. Christine, like <laughs> around the fire. I was seeing it, your hair yeah. is just being tossed around. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah exactly. Let's dance around. Exactly. I Get that her, you know, just that guttural pain out. Cause we don't just carry our own pain. We carry the collective pain yes. too. So tapping into that. And that's been a big part of all the retreats I facilitated for women over the years is giving them a space to, allow their grief out and allow their anger out and just go wild and not need to talk about it. Because I think we talk too much about our issues and our problems and we don't feel them and move them. They're not that alchemy again. We loop yeah, them we just, mm, yeah. we can analyze ourselves to death, but mm-hmm. nothing's changing. Mm, yeah. Love those. Somatics and breath work has been very powerful. Yeah, you combine. For the ecstasy when, as well, yeah. When you teach, when you facilitate breath work, you combine the... I mean, for me, breath. breath work is somatic. It's, they're interchangeable. They're not, they're synonymous with each other. Yeah. 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 I think um, for me, before I did breath work, I, I was doing, you know, various breathing exercises in the Kundalini yoga for many years. And then, um, and then I think I found Wim Hof and did a couple of his trainings. And I, when I did that, I was like, this is just Kundalini yoga. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, hello. Same thing with Dispenza's, you know, breathing yeah. thing. Yeah. When it's I ancient, interviewed him, I was like, no practice. offense, but like what you're doing, I've been doing for a few years. He's like, yeah, I know. It's all, it's all yeah. the same origin yeah. stuff. It says it's just, that too. Yeah. yeah. It's just how you package it up, you know, sure. but um, some of those experiences that I had, especially when I would do like a, you know, four hour workshop or the white tantric, like long Kundalini yoga sets, um, would have extremely psychedelic experiences mm-hmm. before I ever did, well, consciously used plant medicines or psychedelics. Uh, but so many moments of just ecstatic joy, just laughing hysterically for no apparent reason, mm-hmm. uh, just crying, wailing, mm-hmm. suppressed mm-hmm. memories coming up to mm-hmm. be healed, all of that stuff just from moving the body and the nervous system and getting it in the cells and breathing and holding your hands in certain ways and chanting. And that was a really organic way for me to come out um, after many years of sobriety and start to really dig into that stuff that I couldn't get to through yeah. therapy or, you know, the various tools and the 12 steps and stuff. Mm-hmm. But um have to say for me in terms of relationships, uh, those, those last blocks were really just plant medicines, man, just fucking rocked me, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and showed me things about myself and not only showed me, but just dismantled whole structures that I had built to mm-hmm. protect myself. Mm. and they're just they were just gone you know and going in and doing psychic surgery in my brain and we re- rewiring mm. things and disconnecting things and really doing like deep deep quantum work to the point where after the ceremony I'm going like was I just imagining all that that I was was I really doing that and one can never really know but the results are wow so many of those things that I used to be triggered by are just they become yeah. they're just nullified they've unraveled and they're just not a thing you know maybe like we were talking about attachment styles you know it's like there would have been a time where um if I was with a, a lovely Allison here and I was out and I'm running a little late I was supposed to be home and I text and she didn't text me back I would totally freak out and be obsessing on my phone like oh shit is she mad you know what am I, what am I gonna say and, and I'm gotten, just at home like at my altar like <laughs> chanting or something I'm yeah. like oh, okay I see it a little bit he's like oh I thought you were mad at me I was like why would I be mad yeah. <laughs> but over time you know through through those experiences and a lot of work those those the firing of those synapses yes. they, they, they're gone you're making different you know? choices yeah. And, and so whether yeah. it's breath work or plant medicine or working with a therapist or a kundalini yoga practice or whatever it may be, it gives you access to give you a meta awareness of these patterns or behaviors that you've been playing out in your life that haven't been serving you, that have been rewiring and firing and refiring and, and then embedding in your neuronal structure. Right. But then when you're able to see them and you're able to choose differently, well, physiologically you're developing and laying down new new synaptic, synaptic connections, but new neuronal networks. And you keep making that choice again and again and again, and then you get rewarded for that physiologically, emotionally, yeah. and relationally. And then yeah. it, that's the changes, right? And so these, yeah. these experiences, they need to be peak experiences, but they're experiences that we have that are, are, are deeply reflective of what we're not able to see. And, that, and then if we can act on that, that begins the process of solidifying a new path and a new neuronal groove even, and a new behavioral set and a new way of seeing in the world. And even, you know, Alison may do something that upsets you, but previously you would have reacted, but now you respond. 
Totally. That's, that's incredible. So powerful. And that's a great segue into uh, how to fight in a healthy way. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't share my tip. Oh, okay. What's your tip? There might babe? be one person out there that wants to know oh, what sure I want to know too. But I, um, I, I'll try to just make it concise. The thing that just kept coming to me um, is, and that worked for me, is just simply uniting with my own soul. And so the way that I have done that primarily is by my relationship to Great Spirit and Great Mother Earth. And so I found my way to where I'm at by uh, oftentimes uh, being very courageous and just truly living by the directives given to me. And and allowing myself to as illogical or scary as some of those calls and directives given to me might have been, I just trusted and just so bravely, continuously expanded into and, and just opened myself up to um, stepping into and and mm-hmm. and living. Uh, what I was told to do. And just by relentlessly doing that, um, not setting out a, a business plan in the way that we're taught in schools, but just literally, truly living every day by the calls of Great Spirit and Great Mother Earth, that allowed me to unite fully with my soul and then by me being in alignment with who I truly am and in alignment with the mission that I incarnated to be, um, that that's, I don't, I don't know, that's just my answer. That's just what I wanted to say, but it's, <laughs> by, it's by uniting with my soul and connecting um, and, and living by the calls of Great Spirit and Great, mm. great Mother Earth that got me here. Mm. And, and so in, in that discovery is the shedding of those false structures that were needed before because there's now stability and uh, and strength in that relationship with God. Yes, because the calls that come in every day, it can be for me to lay down on my back and to open my legs in the, the butterfly pose and to just spontaneously be directed in this random womb healing that mm. I didn't even know I knew how to do. But all of a sudden, that is what my being needs right now. And I'm being told exactly how to do it. And so one evening, it's this spontaneous, womb healing. And then the next day it's for me to launch third eye certified and it's a more business thing. And then the next day it will take you to every single thread that you need to go to, to get mm. to arrive home within yourself. Mm. Amen, you sister. To, mm-hmm. um, to your point uh, of having a different response to conflict, something difficult, a difficult conversation, two human beings just trying to coexist and you're never going to, you know, 100% of the time see things the same way. There's always going to be a certain amount of potential for friction. Uh, I have definitely noticed, and this is, uh, I guess, going into a bit of the energetics, but I have noticed that I have fine-tuned my ability to breathe through discomfort and being reactive. If she's having a moment, like she got all hangry in the car the other day and was just, just upset, you know? And it's like, I could have gotten defensive, offensive, annoyed, annoyed impatient, blamey. I mean, there's a million <laughs> different directions those old patterns could have taken me and created some bullshit out of nothing when homegirl's just hungry, right? Like she just wants some goddamn barbecue or whatever. No, you know? I, I just, <laughs> I didn't, she didn't want barbecue. The only option was pooters and I didn't yeah. want to eat a pooters. I'm like, oh, I don't know what that is. It sounds <laughs> awful. We're in Texas. I'll find you. It's up by Spice Bread. I said, we'll find um, some barbecue. Don't worry. I don't want barbecue. But, you know, she was just having a moment and it was really beautiful because I just, I think I had the, hmm, cognition that she was in her feminine, mm. you know, and she's ever in her seat, just like, ah, ah, <laughs> you know, just being that storm. And it was like, okay, I can jump on fluid feminine storm too. And then both of us are like, ah, <laughs> why are you being just, this way? Yeah, yeah. Or I just, you know, and sometimes it's just an inherent reaction or, or, or um, response. I'm not like calculated about it, but mm. in that moment I was like, oh yeah, this is like that shit John Wineland talks about, you know, just your container man, 
you know, and just like, really, what's that feel like, babe? Okay. Mm -hmm." (laughs) Even though inside of, you know, sometimes like, God, shut up, you know, (laughs) like I want to just stifle it and get back to having fun and listening to music, but she's not there. So it's like, just breathing into my belly and just feeling the fluidity and the beauty of that storm. And actually, rather than contracting or defending or offending, it's just like an embracing, like, oh, bring all that and I'm going to (laughs) drive. And eventually, we're going to find her some food. She's going to be normal eventually, again. Eventually, I'm going to take her to Pooters <laughs> yeah. and shut her up. She's going to be normal again. But I think in, um, in response versus reaction and in not even conflict <laughs> resolution, but just conflict override yes. of just, there is no conflict a lot of the time just by recognizing, ah, there's a potential trigger here. I'm not going that way. And I'm that going, allows me to to get, move through my thing faster. Yeah, yep. yeah. And I've noticed when I try to rationalize, or like, please don't feel like that. I'll tell you how you should feel because I'm going to give you on paper the actual facts of what's going on right, right. now. That does not work. No. You know? mm-hmm. Trying to bring you into the masculine logic space and explain why you shouldn't be upset is a complete cluster <laughs> F, right? But just going, even in my head, if I'm like, this makes no sense. Like she's being totally illogical. I already know the solution. The place is two miles away. It's open. I already checked. Like I have the whole problem solved. So I think, but just to allow you to have whatever experience you're having in that moment and just compassionately and unconditionally love you, despite the fact that it's somewhat counterintuitive to do so, because there Mm -hmm. is a pull to like, God, I got to prove I'm right or something, you know? Yeah. Mm, Yeah. But for me, it's in the breath. That's where I find that's where I find the compassion and the patience. And then I find myself after that little 10 minute thing has subsided going like, Mm -hmm. well done. Mm -hmm. You could have just made a situation that's really nothing into a thing and had a whole thing. And it's like, is it really worth being right or proving a point? It's just like, never worth it. It's the worst when you, when you take the bait like that from yourself, you know, and engage on that level. Because then you're just headed towards a fight. You're oh, just yeah. headed towards a fight. And I think it's, I love what you said about the masculine is the container. And I, and the same is true for the feminine. I mean, the basic rule of thumb is two people being upset at the same time is going to lead to an argument. So if he's upset about something and he's in his shit, whatever it may be, my role as a feminine is just to hold that space of unconditional love and not going to try to fix them or make them better or going to victim or going to bitch or like any of those things. Just hold that space and let him ride his way through it because men have waves too. You know, it's, it's maybe a little different than the feminine storm, but men have their waves as well. And I notice when I just hold that space of unconditional love, he'll eventually get through it and then he'll come to me. And when I try to go to him too early to fix or comfort, it's like he feels interrupted. And so I've got to give him that space to do whatever he needs to do. Because I think early in our relationship, when I was still working out some of my enmeshment patterns, we had, a, we had a lot of flip-flop. At first, he was really enmeshed with me and I was avoidant. And then he worked his way out, out of that. And I was like, wait, where'd you go? And then I like, <laughs> imagined with hide him. And and seek. He, yeah, so yeah, it was hide and seek, totally. <laughs> um, and when I was in that kind of codependent, I'd always like, it was kind of, I'm not okay unless you're okay type of thing. And my, a really big healing opportunity for me in this relationship is to be okay when he's not okay. Because mm-hmm. I used to let his mood set the mood. Oh man, I know that so well. Oh, That's brutal. Brutal. And yeah. I would, he'd be in a bad mood and I could be in a good mood and I would just be deflated and then build resentment. And so a big growth for me, and I've really seen this shift inside myself is when he goes into one of those, I can just be like, well, I'm here and open when you're ready. Mm. And until you are like, go work out what you need to work out. And that's kept us from getting in parenting roles with each other or that codependent. And it's so helpful for me. Like even today, I had a hangry moment. (laughs) I came in. I also like had just gotten an MRI, which brings up PTSD for me. And so I come home and I was just in, just a lot was coming up. And at first, well, you want to tell the next part? No, you can continue. Well, at first it was kind of met with, he was getting pissed off and met with some... What would you say? Uh, sarcasm. Sarcasm. Yes. Sarcasm. <laughs> I'm good at that. He's really good at cutting sarcasm. I should create a digital course for that. <laughs> That's what I should do. It's like how to be an asshole with sarcasm. <laughs> and it was just making it worse. 
And finally, like he came in and just gave me a hug and let me just melt and have my emotions and get some food. And when I was met with that kind of container energy, then I could move through it. But the more I met with that sarcasm and made to feel like I'm doing something wrong for having my feelings, the more it just escalates. So that's definitely a dance that we've learned is that when one person's having a moment, don't try to fix it and don't condemn it. Just hold in that either that container or that unconditional love let them work through and then be available when they come out of it. Don't be punishing. Because that's the other thing that we see a lot of couples do that we work with is one person will come out of whatever they're in, come to the other person. And then the other person's like, oh, that was so hard for me. And I can't believe da, 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 da. Mm. So being that really loving, receptive place, but that comes back to sovereignty of not letting your partner dictate your, how you feel. That's, that's a really big thing in sacred union. Practicing also regular self-awareness. So for me, I have probably one or two introspective spaces during my day, generally in the morning and in the evening before I, um, so if I'm finishing my work day or, or whatever I'm really focused on that day and before we then connect, I like to spend a little bit of time of reflecting on my day yeah. and just cultivating self-awareness. Like what did I do? What could I have done differently? What did I feel today? Um, why did I feel that? Where did it come from? Am I missing something? Do I feel like I'm neglecting myself today? Whatever it may be, ask a series of questions and just sit. I just sit and feel and I just in that solitude. But also, and I say that to preface it's very important to know where we're coming from. So when I, I, at the beginning of our relationship, this relationship brought up a lot of old stuff for me that I thought I had dealt with. And I did, but not at the layers that this relationship brought up. And so I wanted her to feel bad. When I was feeling bad, I wanted her to feel bad because for me, that was an old coping strategy. That means That meant that either my mom or my dad or my grandparents were relating to me and I was getting attention and love. And that's one of the ways that I got... Uh, I received right. love and I was able to give love in that way, right? And it was that victim, that victim martyr complex. And yeah. I would have and want people to feel sorry for me. We talk about pausing, right? We're talking about breathing. We're talking about the power of just taking a moment to not react. Even if you do nothing, but you're really doing something, but doing nothing is so important and just be in stillness and silence and ask, what do I really want from this scenario right now? How do I really want this to go? I think that can be very, that's been very enlightening for me, um, very revealing for me. And it's, it's helped spotlight, highlight some of the, the patterns that have played out in my life that have kept perpetual distance in a relationship or have perpetuated conflict mm -hmm. in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And today I was, <laughs> I was, I was being cheeky. But I was at least aware of my sarcasm for the first time in, in you know, like, <laughs> not for the first time, sorry, but That's funny. If, in years, generally years before that, I wouldn't be. So I purposely was being, I was being sarcastic to rile her up, but then I knew I needed to be tender with her as well, right? Because that wasn't that wasn't going to help. I couldn't. I didn't know you were actually hungry. I thought it was something else. So I didn't. Well, it was, pick up it on was that both one. of those things. Yeah, I you, didn't realize that you were you were hungry. Yeah, because yeah. she's she's a menace when she wants to eat. <laughs> so it's super cute. It's super cute. But at the same time, <laughs> it's like okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna <laughs> well, those I think those you know those are some of those small personality nuances and differences that that if you have. If you really love one another and, and you value peace and harmony more than being right in conflict, you can work your way through and you're, you're never going to meet a person that's an exact carbon copy of you and how narcissistic and boring that would be. But I think like one thing that we, I wouldn't say we have conflict around it per se, but just one way in which we're so different is food to me is literally, it's almost the same as having to go to the bathroom. Like that's how important it is to me. It's mm -hmm. like, I got to take a dump is like, I'd like a steak. They're mm -hmm. pretty much on equal footing in terms of something that I have to do to just, you know, move around. Be a human. Yeah, to be a human. And so I don't care how food tastes really, whatever. <laughs> like, I just want to get it down and move on with my life. And she is a normal person who likes <laughs> food that tastes good. And there's <laughs> foods that she does like and foods that she doesn't like. And But I'm not. We're actually very similar because like I could give two shits about where we eat, when we eat, like cooking. Well, I'm not saying that you're like a foodie per se. I'm just saying you care about food a little bit more than I. Slightly. As an example, it might be more pronounced to me because I care so little that you caring a little bit more than me creates a contrast. <laughs> but point being 
is I think as you start to really get to know someone and you find what your differences are, that you can start to celebrate them and honor them and kind of put yourself in their shoes, you know? So like, if I'm like, whatever, we'll just eat here. And you go, you know what? I really don't. I don't want pooters. Yeah. I don't want pooters. (laughs) It's like, okay. I'm sure there's there's a million things that I'm very particular about that you tolerate. And even in some cases embrace, right? Because I'm so like specific about my life. So um, having that self-awareness and then being willing to bend a little bit, I find is really, really useful. And also just choosing your battles. Like, is this worth a fight? Sometimes it is. Sometimes shit really goes down and you're like, no, we need to talk. Like, we need to fix this. Rare in our case, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure it'll happen at some point. I think the, the art, the, the, very, the very subtle art is to be able to be self-honoring, you know, be self-honoring of what your needs are and also build character through doing life a little differently to what you've done it. Right. Particularly if you've been single for so long and then you are now living together and you're managing someone else's expectations of how they do life and someone else's habits and patterns of being and all of that. And the balance point is, is can you be self-honoring and express that in a really healthy way, in a loving way and do what you need to do for you and – Adapt. Like as human beings, think about this. So we are, again, we are here, another reason, because we have adapted really well to a changing environment over mm-hmm. millions of years. And whether that's geophysically or whether that's culturally or relationally, emotionally, whatever it may be, the adaptation piece is really important in order for us to then grow to the next level of, you know, expansion, expand to the next level of our expression in the world. I think relationships, either whether it's to self or to others, if we push the edges of that or go to the edges and just remain there for a bit, I think it's very, very rewarding. Mm. Yeah. The only thing I'll, I'll toss into this is um, I think in, in our situation and because we all four have put in a lot of work to get to where we are, the thing that just makes it very easy for me is I just know that whatever might be coming up for you, if it is something that needs to be looked at or addressed, I know for 100% truth, 100% of the time, you'll do the work. Yes. And so I'm not, I don't get all like so nervous and fear-based when I see you in a thing, whatever that thing might be, because in the in all in my body and in all of my being, I'm just like, okay, like, that's something, I think that's something that is going into the area that will need to be brought up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we should talk about, but I don't feel fear because I know we're going to have a healthy discussion about it. And I know that you will be honest with yourself. And if you also agree that that's something that needs to be tended to, you will start tending to it immediately. And I will see the evolution in that piece immediately. Mm. Like when I like when I looked at jogging girl. Oh my god! (laughs) It sounds like a good one. Uh, It's like it's just like a classic dude moment where we're 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 walking the dog up the street where we live in Laurel Canyon, and it's totally unconsciously like I don't even know what I couldn't I I could not pick the girl out of a lineup Mm. a because it had my glasses on b it was just like female shape coming down the road and I just, I'm and with her. And a, in a, in a sports, sports bra. bra. Yeah, and I'm just like... Mm. <laughs> like I'm literally like standing on. right here and he's breaking <laughs> his neck to watch Jogging Girl go for about 30 yeah. to 40 meters and I'm like, hello. And there's like, like no, no way out so of it either. So you disrespectful know? is what it felt like. Mm. Like just blatant in my face, mm. disrespect for about 15 mm. seconds. I was like, um, that will not be going on anymore. <laughs> we will talk about Jogging Girl now. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Funny, funny stuff. We we have, this is Steph's, because um, when we, we got together, we got married legally three months after we got together. So we were really in the fire and that's when a lot came up. And we were having big arguments. Like I had never had really screaming arguments with someone, but we were just in the fire. It was like our souls were like, fast track, we're just going to bring everything up. And luckily we eventually got some help and got out of that screaming fight for a while. 
But when we were in that, I would get, I think both of us would get so scared that the other one was going to run or this wasn't going to work. And, you know, I had come from a divorce. He had moved countries to be with me. So we Mm. felt like we had a lot at stake. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what originated it, but you, you pick it up from here, this. We were in Encinitas. Right. And we were walking, we were staying at Robbie's house. Thinking yeah. We'd gone for a walk. Because one thing we always do is we break down our arguments after we have them. And we're mm. like, what can? What did we learn? That's good. What agreements can we make? Yeah. What really happened there? So we yeah. really- we, we dig deeper. Yeah. To, re, to ensure that, okay, well, if this happens again, how can we really grow from it in a loving way? So we've just gone for a morning walk and we were talking about life, just talking about so many different things, where we're going to live, what we're doing, what the future holds, where we are. We were actually talking about arguing and we were talking about conflict and that one of the ways that we can really navigate conflict uh, through a symbolic gesture outside of talking, because sometimes the talking just goes like this, is one of us just puts a a hand in the air and clenches the fist. And I said, but what I was speaking to was this here represents us and no matter where we are in life, we can always come back to this. And I use it just as an analogy of um, I was speaking about one's purpose and what's important to one's life and where are they and how do they get to that and the clarity. But I, we ended up just making this, no matter what's happening, if we're if, – Arm if in the air, fist She's fist in clench. a lot of pain or mm-hmm. she's upset or vice versa. Or in a fight that we're just not yeah, getting – one of us does it's a pattern break. It's a reminder that we're always going to come back to love, mm. that we need and keep arguing. And if we have to just take some space. Mm-hmm. We, we know enough, again, what research demonstrates, and we can talk about this in a moment if you like, but how to, how to have conflict in a healthy way, how to argue in a healthy way for, from a physiological perspective and a, and a rebuilding the, the relationship perspective. But that there is like, whoa, yeah. we have to remember, yes, we have a difference of opinion right now and that's cool. But how are we interacting with that opinion? Because it's not healthy. We're so on the this, same team. Th- we're on the same team. That's yeah. what this means. We're, we're team, we're family, we're open, we're together. And and this is, you know, we're, we're together for life. Like, this is the commitment that we've made to each other. Um, and it and helps those abandonment or rejection fears too. Yeah. Because it's, you know, when he does that to me, I'm like, oh wait, he's not going anywhere. And same with me. You know, it's like, okay, we're arguing right now. We're in something and we've got this to remind us, I like love this it. is where we're headed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's been times where like, because we have an agreement, so we have argument agreements. And one of the argu- agreements is, <laughs> you can totally, you can take it. Totally <laughs> um, is we don't storm out of rooms. We don't just leave. And if we need space, that's fine. But we say, I'll be back in an hour. I'll be back in two mm-hmm. hours. I just need some space or I just need some space. I'm coming back. So that the other one doesn't feel that abandonment because we learned, we decided early in our relationship, we didn't want to, you know, I think fights are good. I think they add passion. Like I think the conflict grows the relationship and adds some passion and, and kicks up the dust a little bit, but it's the, how quickly you can repair and learn from contrast. it. And we don't find ourselves having the same mm-hmm. argument mm-hmm. over again. So having agreements about how we argue has been really, really helpful for us. Because for mm. me, conflict avoidant, stuff everything inside, hold all my emotions in until I make myself sick. Arguments scared me. Mm. I, I, you know, he comes from a Greek, Italian, loud family. I come from, you know, let's hold it inside kind of thing. And so my nervous system would get so rattled whenever we'd have an agreement that I'd, I'd go into that, you know, oh, sorry, whenever we have an, an argument, yes, that, I would go into that place of, you know, the trauma response is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And I'd go into freezing or fawning. What's fawning? Fawning is what do I need to do to make this better? Okay. Yeah. And by having those agreements, it can settle my nervous system because I'm like, okay, this is just just a bump. This isn't something that's detrimental. It's not going to lead to us breaking up. And so we highly recommend that to couples. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Super simple. I'm a fawner. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I didn't even know about that F, Mm -hmm. that one of the F. I know that you left one out, the fornicate one, but um, that's what they say. Yeah, I didn't make this up, but that's a good one. You know, like, because I don't like conflict. There was a lot of conflict at times when I was a kid and it was terrifying. So I don't like like ah, yelling and shit getting thrown and like all that is just, I shut down really hard. And so it's like, 
yeah, I want to get everyone happy again as quickly as possible. So this feeling I'm experiencing goes yeah. away. I know you have those tendencies and this is just another quick little share, but um, because I know you have that tendency of um, more withholding to make peace and I... Um, haven't verbalized this, but just have set the intention lately that I would actually like to hear from you and know from you more a little bit if I'm doing something that does make you uncomfortable or annoyed. Um, Because sometimes I feel like you might withhold or fawn a little too much, whatever that might mean. So that's why last night when we were watching the Cobra Kai and he was eating his thumb off. Um, <laughs> when, Tasty. When, when I was trying to get my blanket, he happened to be sitting on the blanket. So I was just trying to move it so that I could cover my feet. And um, he got a little annoyed because he's very into this new series. <laughs> and he's, he's like, oh God, it's, you're being annoying. I'm just trying to relax. And he's actually never, ever, ever, mm. ever articulated anything like that to me at all. And so <laughs> I was so like caught off guard. And so I just got my blanket and kind of huddled in the corner. And I was like, I don't, how do I feel about this? And I, part of me, you know, my feelings were like a little hurt and like yeah. the little girl of in me course. was a little like sobby. And I was like, am I being annoying? And, <laughs> and so I was being a little sobby, but I really just stayed with it and breathed with it. And I just tended to that, that, that little, little one, girl. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it's okay. This is really not a big deal. And I didn't say anything on purpose because once I was able to sit with those feelings and do what I needed to do, I was actually glad. I'm like, he's doing the thing. Mm. He's, oh, he's expressing more of the thing that I actually was hoping he would start to do. So my intention is actually opening. So don't now get on him and being like, what do you mean? I wasn't in, you know, yeah. like just let this be. Mm. Um, so you were totally unaware that any of that happened. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You had no idea. No clue. Cause I just, you know, mm-hmm. did what I needed to do, but I was really kind of mm-hmm. glad in a weird way that for the first time you said I was being annoying. <laughs> I don't know. And you did such the, the healthy, <laughs> conscious relationship thing to do is you parented your own inner child. That's a self-regulation, That's a sovereignty, self-regulation. self-autonomy piece. Is that where we get into like the codependence with relationship is I want him to take care of me. Like you hurt me, you fix it, you take care of me. And what you did is you're like, okay, I'm hurt. I recognize this. Let me parent my little girl. Let me calm her down. And then you could actually see the situation so clearly and go, oh, wait, this has nothing to do with me. He's just feeling safe enough now with me that he can express this. This is actually kind of a weird compliment. Yes. Yes. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the beauty of you sharing that now and Luke integrating that within himself is he may say then, oh, now that I feel safe to express that because I have a real life example of being met with love actually, or at least not, at least not reactivity, you get to say to yourself, well, maybe I can express that in a kind of way or in a way that won't upset her. Yeah. And, and, and that's when now you grow together. Yeah. Mm, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, a piece too that, I don't know if it's a male, female exclusively, it could just be an energetic thing. So I like to, you know, consider people listening to the show might not be in a male, female relationship, um, but I am. And so that's my point of reference. But energetically in masculine manhood for me, if I do get upset and emotional and triggered into anything close to fight or flight, my brain shuts down mm-hmm. and I cannot come up with one rational thought or thing to say. I can attest to this. It's just like <laughs> white out. And I got to go away and not talk about it Mm. until that feeling goes away. Then I'm like, oh, then I can logically dissect something and and come up with the solution. Mm -hmm. And and likewise, if ever, not because of her, but just in life, work, whatever, I'm overwhelmed, stress, legal shit, tax shit, whatever, just the stuff that hits you. um, Life comes at you fast, as they say sometimes. When that's going on, she can, you know, visibly notice that I'm upset, not with her, but just upset. And she wants to soothe me by getting me to talk about my problems. Mm -hmm. And I've learned uh, over time that when I'm still in a problem and I haven't fixed it yet, it makes me more pissed and more upset to talk about said problem. So we've learned, I think it's been another tool is for 
for Allison to learn to just like, let me go freak out until I fix my shit. And then I'm happy to come back and share about what the problem had been. And here's what I did to fix it. And I feel very successful. <laughs> I'm really high in testosterone because I had this problem and I conquered it. And now I'm back to report that I won. You know, you do validated. You, yeah, 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 do yeah. you do you share in that? Like yeah, can do. Like talking about my problems makes them worse. Yeah, and, and that's, depends. that's the thing I observe. Depends, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it depends on a number of things, but what I'm hearing you say as well is that you know you've you're really wanting to quote unquote fix your problem yourself. Uh, the issue that you're facing, you want to take care of it yourself. And there's a you there's a feeling of oh, I'm of utility now, I'm of value now, and that is a masculine journey, but it is also a male evolutionary process that we've gone through as men to be of great utility to our tribe. And what I've often found for me is when I am in the middle of something and someone attempts to come in to help me, if I'm in a space of low self-worth or not believing in myself, I will interpret their willingness or yearning to assist me as in you're not good enough, let me do it for you or let me help you because oh, you're that's not good. enough. Yeah, right? yeah, that's good. Yeah. And then I get very frustrated. So my frustration doesn't come from someone trying to help me, but me not dealing with my unresolved low self-worth in that instance or maybe it's an ongoing thing. And so, yes, I still am a big advocate of autonomy and sovereignty and being in solitude with one's stuff and working on it on yourself and – can we accept assistance and help? And often we'll find that when we cannot accept that assistance and help, when it, when it charges us, it's less about them trying to help us and more about the way we feel about ourselves because we can't navigate through this issue in the way that we think we should. Mm -hmm. So we're shooting the fuck out of ourselves basically. I'm just thinking of a moment we had a couple of weeks ago where you didn't sleep and you got up before me. And it's, it's really a feat if Steph can get out of bed without waking me up because I'm like a light sleeper. But somehow he slipped out Legit. of bed. He slipped out of bed and um, I came in the kitchen and he asked me to read something he wrote and I could tell he was working his way through something. And so he had done, and this is a beautiful thing about Sacred Union, he had done a lot of processing on his own, but it was the sharing of it with me while he was still in it and some things that I was able to reflect. Because I asked for it. Yes, because you mm. asked for it. That was that final layer. And so I think that's the beauty of a relationship is we can get pretty far on our own. And when we have a loving partner that can reflect things back or ask questions or say the things that we really need to hear, it's like another deeper level of healing can come forward. Yeah. And that's really the, the beauty. Because I think we're saying a lot, yes, be sovereign, do your own work. And the relationship, the container itself is it's part healing. Of it. yes. It's part of doing your own work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with Christine as well, particularly... As you both know, she's very she's an ex, she's exceptional at what she does in the world and how she serves people and how insightful you Thank are you. and how you're able to map consciousness and and understand people and and see patterns and 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 be that psychological detective and all that. And I think over the years, well, I don't think I know over the years. I mean, I've seen you. We've spoken about this. Christine's very reluctant to give advice or insight unless she's asked for it. Mm -hmm. And so I have to constantly mm -hmm. say. Tell me what you're saying. <laughs> I have to say that. Very I didn't rarely, want to be his coach. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want him to be my coach either. But when I, it's almost when I say that, when I say, tell me what you're feeling. Tell me your intuition. Tell me your insight. The coach's hat comes off and the wife, partner, best friend, person sitting here that just loves you compassionately saying, hey, this is what I'm seeing and feeling. Mm -hmm. And that, that level of permission is very empowering for me because then because A, I'm asking for it, so I'm very willing and open to hear it and feel it and absorb it. And B, it bonds us because it really does allow you to, it gives you permission to not hold back. Because mm -hmm. I'm saying, I don't want you to hold back. Don't, don't, it's not about coaching. Just tell me what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you're seeing. Yeah, that's the exact, that when I wrote on the piece of paper, I have one thing that I want to share. Beautiful segue into that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I thought it was the story about me telling you you're annoying. <laughs> uh, no, no. That was an unexpected uh, little gem that emerged. But um it's it, this is the last little piece that kept coming in before we sat here. It's like, make sure you talk about this because I think there is, again, something um, really beautiful about all four of us being on the consciousness evolutionary path and, and committed to doing um, that kind of work. And we're also in relationships. So I, let's see how I want to pose this exact question. 
I think that there's something unique and beautiful that comes with that then when you've got two people in the relationship who have their own spiritual gifts and some gifts may be similar between the two, but then of course there are a lot of spiritual activations and gifts and abilities that are very unique to you, Christine, unique to you, Steph, you know, and unique to each of us. And so it's that dance then, that unique dance that comes in this kind of sacred relationship of, um, you know, honoring when you might be getting an intuitive hit that Mm -hmm. is, you know, perhaps uh, the opposite direction that he's maybe wanting to go with. um, I was kind of chuckling when you were sharing in an interview we were listening to um, about his, when he's going on the vision quest. Oh yes. You know, and just what comes up for, for you. And, um, but yet, he's honing in on something within his own soul that's directing him to go on this quest as scary or maybe dangerous as it might seem. And we have come up against this piece a lot with, um, you know, he just, for whatever reason, uh, gets pulled into plant medicines way more than I do. You know, and the irony is that I'm the shaman and, you know, it's like, but um, I mean, we're all shamans in our own ways, of course. But uh, so that's been a funny thing within our dance of, you know, I'm very skilled at seeing, especially people's shadows. And just when there's anything at all coming into play, that's not of the highest. Mm. And um, so then, you know, voicing that, but then he's on his own yes. path. And, and and then sometimes he might say to me, but I am really feeling called. So I don't really know what question, I just think that this might be of service to mm. people listening that w- are wanting to be in this kind of relationship. And these are the things that you're gonna hit up against when yes. you're dealing with people that have their spiritual abilities activated. Yes. Well, I think, for me with that particular issue, it has a lot to do with getting to know you and your gifts and insights and, and honoring that. And we, she's um, alluding to one particular um, impasse where I had been journeying a lot for like a couple of years, just all positive experiences. So why would I not do this all the time? It's like, this is amazing. Every time I go on a journey, boom, 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 boom. I'm just like killing it. God's killing it for me. All right, I'll have a little humility. <laughs> but I mean, like, I'm getting a lot accomplished, a lot of healing, a lot of expansion and growth. So it's like, well, of course, I'm going to keep doing that. And then um, and then there was one point a few months ago where I had gone and uh, smoked the Bufo Toad, the 5-MAO DMT, mm. which for anyone that's experienced that, you know, it's... Is that your first quite, time? That was the first time, yeah. Quite an earth-shattering um, experience, to say the least. Mm. And, um, and I came home, you know, it doesn't last long. It was an afternoon thing, but like, you know, I told her I'd be home at a certain time. I'm out in Venice. We're in Laurel Canyon. And afterwards started hanging out, integrating, smoking cigars, kind of chilling. So it's like, you know, what was going to be a 90 minute thing turned into a multi-hour thing. And then I got like the guilt trip, like, you know, scared little boy. Ah, she's mad at me. Like energy kind of came in. I started to trip out on that a little bit. I tried to call her. She didn't pick up. I got like attachment anxiety shit. Like, oh man, I'm going to go home and she's going to like bad trip me and this whole kind of spin out. And I get home and I think I was carrying that energy. And then we had this conversation, I believe in that moment where she's like, Hey, you know, it's your life, do whatever. But like, this doesn't feel right. You, Mm -hmm. where you are right now tonight, after this experience, as beautiful as you say it was, feels off to me. Now, the old me would have been like, well, good for you. Too bad. I know what I'm doing and just totally ignored that. But um, knowing her gifts and getting to know her, I was like, okay, this is uncomfortable because I just had what was probably the most profound experience of my entire lifetimes, Mm -hmm. but okay, I'll feel into this. And it's funny because, uh, you know, I kind of slept on it and I thought, hmm, maybe there is something here that I can't see, you know? Uh, And then I started to see like, wow, I have had all of these realizations in the past couple of years, profound realizations about the nature of the universe, the nature of my life, my experience, all of it. And I'm pretty good at integrating and applying lessons. I mean, I've been doing it for a long time. I don't just read a spiritual book. I read it and I'm like, okay, that sentence says do that. Then I go do it. I'm I'm uh, uh, um, someone who likes to apply a truth. Anyway, when that happened, 
I took a pause and I thought, maybe she sees something that's valid that I don't. And that was just out of my respect for your gifts. Mm. What ensued was all of this 3D earth stuff was just about to happen. Taxes, buying a business partner out, just stuff that required me to be so down to earth, so grounded at my desk, organized desk, pen, paper, emails, uh that world that I don't like to be in at all. I could float in the ethers all day, every day, the rest of my existence and be stoked. I don't like the (laughs) earthly realm much. Um, But then it was a great opportunity for me to see, ah, she did see something. It's not that I was doing anything wrong or I was in trouble by journeying so often. It's just there was something coming, a wave of real life 3D shit that I needed all of my faculties for. Mm. And even with all my faculties, it was pretty gnarly. It was a gnarly period there of losing an assistant, hiring another one that didn't work out, just all that stuff. And that gave me really a lot of respect for for your gifts of like, oh shit, like I didn't, I wouldn't have seen that coming. I might've just been kept going, you know, Mm. once a month or whatever I was doing off on my, on my trips, you know? Well, yeah, it was that. And also, you know, I understand about applying, like reading, okay, do, but these medicines, as you know, but for anyone who doesn't know, like these medicines forever continue to work, 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 work. Like they will just always be working with you. And, um, and I do think along with what you just shared, there is there was that other piece of this of just like these successive compounding, compounding, now this one, now this different one, now this different, now this one, and now this one's the same, and then this one. And it's like you weren't, it felt to me, mm-hmm. you were not giving it proper sacred space to continue mm-hmm. teaching and weaving. You were compounding them just way too much and getting into that extremist place that felt dangerous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. not of the sacred essence that each one should be handled in. So don't forget that there's that piece too. Thank you you for that, babe. It's interesting, right? Because the extremist place that men can get to particularly is very unstable for the feminine and very, it feels very unsafe because it's so unpredictable. Ah, that's a good point. Very unpredictable and it's extreme and it's intense and in intensity. And it's just like driving a car, like driving at 40 miles an hour. Cool. 60 80, 100, 120, 150 miles an hour, all of a sudden, you got to, there's, there's more attention and effort required to control that vehicle. And if you're moving in extremes, there's more effort that's required and that can be challenging. And that, that perception of, oh, you're unstable, you're unsafe, can bring up a lot for the feminine within any individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But that that was a really interesting dance in our in our relationship and I guess continues to be to some... It happened the other day. Degree, yeah, yeah, because after that, then it sort of turned into a thing where I'm like, I don't know, an opportunity presents itself. I'm feeling into it. And I think, this feels pretty good. I want to do it. And it's like, ah, oh, shit, I got to talk to Allison about it. This is it. a sensitive thing now yeah, for yeah. us. Yeah, like it's the, all not these just journeys. me. Like yeah. my whole life, I just do whatever I want and ever want to do it, you know, which is a very lonely life ultimately. And so it's much better to have someone, but yeah, now it's like, you know, the other day I got a text here in Austin from a friend and it was to go sit with Toad again. And I was like, ding, 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 ding. It's time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, is it really Luke? You know, looking in the mirror, looking in my heart, pausing, sat on it for a few hours, then mentioned to her, I was like, oh, I hope she doesn't like bum out on this because I'm feeling pretty cold. Well, I'm not ever going to try to control, but it's just like, you know, I just want it really thoroughly and properly felt into because I'm also, I'm highly discerning Mm -hmm. and I really trust my discernment. So when these experiences are presented, you have to, not you guys, but just anyone listening would want you to understand, like I'm then going into as someone who facilitates spaces like Mm -hmm. similarly, I'm like, I don't know who these people are. Exactly. I don't know who is facilitating. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? What's the intention behind it? Exactly. The lineage that follows. It's, uh, we could speak to, (laughs) uh, we could speak to to Sacrament and Plumus and how it's used in modern day community so much. It's so different Mm -hmm. to, I I wrote a very long blog on this a couple of years ago, actually. Oh, good. We'll link to it. Yeah, I'll get a point. But I I think like in in summary of that point, because I know we've got a dinner uh, soon, but it's been one of those interesting things to to navigate in that there's the sovereignty piece. Like I'm my own man. I know what I'm doing and I make mistakes and I'm willing to own them and I'll accept the consequences of said mistakes. Uh, there's that piece, but then there's also, you know, there's the relationship and there's her. So there's mm-hmm. an honoring to that where I might really want to go do something, but for whatever reason, she's not able to, um, 
you know, cultivate a feeling of feeling yeah. comfortable and safe with that. You know, yeah. maybe she met the people and gets really bad vibes off them or whatever. And it's like, yeah, yeah, it's my life. But because we have a shared life, then there's a certain bleed over into her experience that one needs to be mindful of. And the of. two that you felt really, this is the last thing I'll share, the two that since that initial thing, the two that you felt very called to do, I sat with it and did the work with you in it. And I also arrived to a place where I'm like, okay, I think this also feels aligned. Like I did my own communications and prayers. And um, so <laughs> thankfully, yeah. since, you know, the two you felt very called to do, I also eventually arrived to a place of peace within my own self. So there wasn't this huge combative, like, I don't feel good about this. And you're just like, well, I do. So yeah. I don't know what's going to happen when that happens. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. there's just a place of balance and, and harmony there, but it has been really good for me just yeah. to kind of like be a bit more thoughtful about it and a little less cavalier and, yeah. well, and I you know, think slow my roll a bit. And that's part it's of been good for me. You know, is, is someone like the way we help each other grow isn't just through conflict and isn't just through heart expansion, but it's also, you know, having the other person be a little bit of a compass in some way and be like, hmm, because uh, sometimes it comes from needing to feel safe, but a lot of times it just comes from our intuition. Like he'll say something, I'm like, Mm, that doesn't feel good. And it's not, I'm not feeling fear. It just doesn't yeah. sit well yes. in my body. And the, he, he calls me on stuff too. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about a healthy relationship is you really start to, like I trust an example. When it comes to anything physical, I trust him. Like if we're hiking where there's bears or there's anything that's physically challenging or danger or whatever, He's gotten really into guns since we've moved to Texas and has become an excellent <laughs> shooter. And, uh, Take me shooting. Like, 100%. yeah, he's really 100%. great. All yeah. those things, like I have ju- I have nothing to prove. And like, I really surrender to him because that's like, that's one of his many gifts. I don't even try to com- compete's the wrong word. And then there's certain things that he's really acknowledged in me. So I think it's just finding those things in your partner and, and, because we see this a lot in couples we coach, couples get competitive with each other, like inside the relationship. Brutal. Yeah. And it, it, it is brutal. And it's like, acknowledge each other's gifts, recognize them, recognize the ones you share, and then recognize the ones that are different that you can really call each other out in. Because I think that's an important part of the growth. I mean, you really call me forward in physical things. Like there'll be things like, even the shooting example, I didn't want to go do it. And you kept, it's going to be good for you. And it's going to be, and it turns out I was a sniper in a past life. And I'm excellent (laughs) with an assault rifle. Like, but it, it, and he's able to say, no, that's not your fear. Your nervous system's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. tap into that inner warrior. This is not your fear. This is just your head. And I'm glad he called me forward in that way. But it's because I know that's an area where he's extremely gifted. Yeah, and and we have to give ourselves permission within the coupledom to, if I want to make a choice that Christine doesn't feel strongly about, or vice versa, I'll make that choice and I'll learn. You know, as long as I'm not intentionally attempting to hurt her or myself or us, or create distance in the relationship, or be ignorant and stubborn, that's not my intention. And and I really sit with it because at some point you you, you may get to a place where. You're adamant on something that you want to be or do and you're adamant on the exact opposite of that and you've both done an adequate amount of deep inner exploration and you're still feeling that and you're still feeling that. It's not about right and wrong. It's about, well, okay, and this is the balance point. Like, Can you release that and still be there but still be self-honoring? What does it look like? Right. Who knows? Yeah. That's, that's the challenging part. Can you be self-honoring for you and do what you need to do for you and – really hear and feel everything your partner is saying, where do you find that balance mm-hmm. point? And it's not just in that moment, it's also across many moments, past, present, and even future projected. Yeah. And that's something that we, I mean, we learn and grow through all Yeah, because we're the very, time. we're similar in our values and, and visions. And very different in, in other ways. different in so many ways. Very many, very different mm-hmm. in other ways. And, and I also have learned over time to really respect Christine's intuition and her fears. And her yeah. fears, even her irrational fears, I have to respect They're that. Irrational, you, but they make perfect sense. <laughs> that's me. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I mean. And yeah. and and and, mm-hmm. and I know Christine is really learning that about about me as well, yeah. and helping me in that in that place. So things that I want to do that are quite adventurous and more leaning towards the adrenaline. 
that doesn't sit great with Christine. And I also have to think that, okay, mm-hmm. I've got a family now and, you know, maybe a baby on the way at some point very soon. And I have to think about how I want to live my life too. So, I mean, I, I don't mm-hmm. think there's any right and wrong mm-hmm. path, but. Say what you say about freedom through commitment as we start to wrap up because I think that's a really good, especially for men or people that have trouble with the commitment piece. Yeah, I spend a lot of my time, a lot of my time, a lot of my life um, defining freedom uh, by not being committed to anything. So no houses, Mm. no loans, no businesses. I mean, I I did have businesses, had a business part, have had business partners, but that was a real struggle. There was always resistance. So I was never fully in. Relationships were the same thing. But I have found freedom through commitment because, and it's, it's, it's paradoxical, but I'm so committed to the commitment of whatever I'm making that I'm allowing that situation and all its elements and variables to come through to me. I'm completely open. I'm not holding back. If you were similar to the abandonment example that I gave you, you're able to lean so much deeper and deeper into love because it's not that you don't care if she leaves, but you're okay to feel you're, her leaving. You're okay to grieve. You're okay to not be attached to the outcome. And that's, for me, I don't have this massive fear around my freedom being taken away because my relationship to it is completely different. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I feel freer in the commitment, in the commitment of mm-hmm. this relationship. I feel freer that if, any, if there's anything we need to speak about, if it's uncomfortable, I'm bringing it to our container. And we have uncomfortable conversations, very uncomfortable conversations, very uncomfortable conversations <laughs> that we both go back. But I'm so committed to this relationship and to this human being and our container and what we're creating in the world that I have so much clarity. I've surrendered to the commitment that I have so much clarity that I have freedom. Yeah. No matter, I will always say to Christina, I always have, should I say, um, no matter what it is that we have to go through, we're going to get through it. I just, I can't see how we cannot get through it. We've got to work it out. That's just, yeah. I don't know. That's just the way I think. So I don't know. No, that resonates. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I know we're, we're out of time because we got to get to dinner. <laughs> and I also haven't eaten because I've been recording all day. Oh, no. Now, uh, now I care now about food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I take back what I said. It's not utilitarian. <laughs> but that freedom piece, I just have to touch on this because it's so meaningful to, uh, to uh, my, my love, Allison, here. You know, I interviewed her about four years ago in New York City. Mm-hmm. You know, on the up and up, all professional. I was celibate at the time. Um, and I guess she was too, but we had the, it's funny, we went to do this interview and um, she brought me into this workspace, like a beautiful space, but it was really loud. And I was like, dude, we, I can't record in here. Like you got to find us a, a quieter room. And she did. So we ended up in this little utility closet of this retail building in New York City. And we're in this very close quarters, kind of like about as big as this little space we're in. And we're kind of like seated very close to one another. And I don't know, somehow the conversation veered into this very vulnerable place and I had been having the realization in a very similar way that I always valued my freedom, man. No one's going to tie me down. I do what I want when I want. I'm not committing to no woman, you know, this whole (laughs) bullshit that, that was, it's just hilarious now, but God, it's so funny. I have to give little Luke a pat. Mm. Like it was just, I was just immature, you know, but I said to her and, and I, I cried. It was probably the first time I ever cried on my podcast. And now I cry in almost every episode. (laughs) It's ridiculous. But I said, you know, I've discovered that, um, you know, I've always valued this freedom so highly that it actually became a restriction, you know, a prison. And that the true freedom is the freedom that we talked about earlier, the freedom to love with reckless abandon and just go all in showing who you really are, you you know, and being seen and seeing another. I mean, the freedom that I was clinging to was so superficial and in hindsight so, so yeah so rigid and just flimsy and just of low value freedom it's like a freedom to move your body where you want to move your body and with whom you want to move it but not a freedom of expression in your soul yes mm-hmm. that expression into delving into the expanse of consciousness and choosing to be a single point of focus in that consciousness with another and then forming a third single point of that consciousness like that. Mm. It's a whole other realm, you know, versus like, (laughs) I want to do three girls at a time. (laughs) It's just like, Oh my God, that was so stupid. You know, just like hilarious in hindsight. And that was really like our first bond. And when I shared that, like I said, I teared up and she was just like, 
100% with me. Mm. She was just there, just yeah. leaning in, open, ready, having it. It was a really special moment. Mm-hmm. And it probably was the moment we fell in love, I would say, or at least I fell in love. Mm. I didn't know it, but I had never been um, so vulnerable with a woman at that depth of realization and been so honored and held and, yes. and met. Yeah, like met. non-judgment and compassion. Yeah, just 100%. Uh, she's like, yep, I'm all about it. Yeah. You know, she's just right there. And I was like, whoa, yeah. this is weird. Get me out of here. <laughs> Four years later, yeah. now, now we're together. Too yes. much intimacy. Too fast, too fast. <laughs> but that's one thing I'd say about you and, and, and previous just human beings that I've had in my life that have been able to hold that space is that you, I feel so safe in our conversations mm-hmm. and our interactions and relationships because I know no matter how difficult it, it may be for you, you're going to stay there. Yes. You're going to be there. Yeah. It's not about leaving the relationship. I don't have that fear of Christine leaving me, leaving me because I feel I'm so far healthier, integrated from when we first – well, because when we first met, we were going through a lot of shadow stuff. I was particularly um, – that was coming up and it needed to. But when you can have a partnership where both people are really safe for each other, your lighthouses for each other and your foghorns for each other, you know that there, there's that stability there. No matter what you bring, it will be met with – openness mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. that's what that's what continues to build trust and expands the you know the individual sovereign journey but also that relationship yeah well, there's so much more to say about that that's beautiful <laughs> Kelly, that's a perfect right, way to end. Yeah, yeah that's a that's a great ending moment uh, and like like we've said there's so much more to discuss but we are two hours and 16 minutes wow. in so Okay. Yeah, it is. You always know it's a good episode when it goes over two hours, <laughs> oh, and I don't really notice. I didn't notice yeah, at all. Was, wow. Yeah, so so thank thank you both thank so much, you. and thank, thank you, you, my, yeah, my thank darling, you thank you. That's so nice. my darling angel. Thanks for sitting in with us, <laughs> darling and, uh, angel. And I'm just so appreciative of you and everything that you are, and oh, thank you. I just feel like the luckiest guy in the world. And the same for for you too. It's really lovely to know you and mm-hmm. and get to know you even better today. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, thank you thanks. so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Bye. You guys ready to go eat? Let's yeah. do this. Yeah. <laughs>